Four o'clock. Okay, good. All right, so welcome again to the FDG uh, 2020 Virtual Doctoral Consortium. Um, so what we will be doing uh, in the next sort of four-ish hours is basically two things. You will have direct feedback from mentors to basically the um, proposals and, and, and sort of reports on your uh, PhD project that you did send us. That is one thing. Um, and then there's another thing a little later in the, in the program where I'd just like us to talk a bit more in general terms about what it means to be on an academic career path uh, what it means to be, I think I said, uh, being in, in one of the sort of worst at, and at the same time most wonderful career possible. And uh, I think, um, yeah, the mentors and me will also have something to say about it. And I think both parts up uh, will hopefully be equally valuable for you. Um, both the, the sort of the topical part and the more like general, in a sense, career advice and career discussion, which is sort of the second part. part. And um, for this, I think it's also interesting that I think the mentors represent a bit of a wider range of, of career stages, uh, which uh, I think is also quite uh, interesting for you to hear about. Um, there is some sort of a last minute absence, unfortunately. Scott Redberg could not do it due to COVID complications in his family. His daughter um, uh, is suspected of, of having COVID. We're waiting for, for the test to come back. And actually exactly at his uh, 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 slot today, he is scheduled to do a test himself. So in, in that sense, uh, that's very unfortunate, but we cannot do much about it. Um, I have uh, 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 been able to exchange a, a Scott's review with one by Rebecca Rouse, uh, who cannot be here, but she wrote a very nice and I think for a review. review. And uh, uh, so I think we still have enough to talk about in, in this regards. Okay, I think with that, uh, without much further ado, um, I would like to, um, well, I mean, so basically, yeah, before I forget that, basically, so the two mentors we have here now are Henrik, and I will ask him in, in a second to say a little bit about himself. And later, uh, Andy Phelps will join us. I don't think he's online yet. It's still awfully early in Washington, D.C. So, um, but he will join us at, at about uh, 4.30 and I think will then uh, stay with us. Um, so Henrik, maybe you can say a couple sentences about yourself and then we will start with the first uh, presentation by Jeppe. So hi, I'm Henrik. Uh, I will be giving mentorship to three of you, I think, right Hartman? Yeah. Yes, correct. Uh, so I have the right number of PDFs open here. Uh, I am right now an adjunct assistant professor at Södertörn University in Sweden. I was up until this summer an actual assistant professor at Uppsala University, but I left to start a position in the US. But like many things, that's now up in the air because of COVID. So maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that and career choices you make. One of them is don't leave your job in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I do mostly work on user experience and artificial intelligence. So I'm interested in how people interact with artificial intelligence in games and how they use that to both create interesting things, but also how they have interesting game experiences with artificial intelligence. And I'm also interested in how we should use artificial intelligence for game design, how we need to design things differently to make use of all these magical powers that artificial intelligence will give us. So that's a little bit about me. All right, thank you. And I've, uh, when Andy uh, will join us, he, I think, can speak uh, for himself. But I mean, Andy is, um, well, in a sense, a seasoned academic who has been a uh, director of a program, which he recently left to be, become director, I think, of two programs at the same time on two different continents. How he manages to do that is uh, a bit beyond me, but he is director of a program on games in, at American University in Washington, DC. 
and uh, on a program in, I think it's Wellington in New Zealand. I think we call that playing academia on hard mode. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, he basically managed to, to agree uh, to have both institutions agree to have him six months respectively. So he was until recently on his uh, uh, New Zealand stay and is now again in the US. So that's, that's really, you know, that's, that's the level, you know, I, I'm not sure we can all level up to that, but yes, just to give an idea here. Okay, well, with, uh, I mean, uh, maybe I should say also a word about myself. Uh, I was uh, up until recently um, Professor for Interactive Narrative Design at the University of the Arts uh, in Utrecht, and I'm currently a visiting uh, researcher, visiting professor at the University of Amsterdam in the Informatics Institute. And yeah, I think that's uh, what I can say for now. All right. Yep. Um, do I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, I wanted to say one last thing. Sorry. Oh. Um, maybe you noticed that this is an all-male panel of mentors. And honestly, I did not like that at all. So I wanted to say that. Um, I really tried uh, to also get several uh, women academics to be mentors here. Um, unfortunately, every single one of them that I contacted was either at a uh, FDG workshop that is, which is running at the same time um, or, or busy with other things. So um, just to be clear about it, it was not necessarily, uh, uh, was not really my choice to have uh, all men here. I'm, I'm fully aware how this kind of looks like and yeah. Uh, it, it just so happened, uh, and, and for that, I'm, I'm really happy that Rebecca, even though she cannot uh, be here, uh, has agreed to um, help us out with uh, one review here. Okay, now finally, Jeppe, it's all yours. Yes, all right, I'll try and share my screen. Uh, does that look fine to everybody? Looks good. All right, uh, let me see. Okay, so um, yeah, I have around 10 minutes, right? So um, I'll try and go for that. Um, so my overall topic is uh, puzzle level evaluation, uh, or level two. Uh, so what I want to do is uh, it's a collaboration with Tactile Games and the IT University of Copenhagen. And uh, Tactile Games, uh, they make these kind of puzzle games, casual puzzle games where uh, the level designers, they spend a lot of time creating new levels and releasing content continuously. So they wanted a tool that could evaluate the difficulty of the levels and that's then where uh, I come in. Um, and um, yeah, the fact that it's in collaboration with a company also put some design guidelines. So it has, so it matches with their, uh, workflow and uh, the overall goal or specific goal for now at least uh, that we have uh, agreed on is it just needs to uh, learn the completion rate of the level. So by that I mean you have a number of moves here and if you fail or if you don't complete the level within that move limit then you fail the level and that is something that is um, used to evaluate the difficulty because uh, maybe you spend, maybe you uh, complete it half the time, then you have a completion rate of 50%. And that's what they use to evaluate or design the level flow. So it, uh, you know, uh, it follows an ice curve. Um, so that's the first goal of the, the tool, but then there are also a number of guidelines that we want to, uh, to follow that are more determined by other factors. And um, in, in this case, uh, we have, we want to do it where we have limited control over the game. So all these typical agent uh, that you see, agents that you see for playing games, we can't just use all of them or at least not easily because we don't have access to like procedural content generation on the game to, to increase the data. Or we, ha we don't have a forward model, so we can't really do many of these uh, Monte Carlo tree search uh, approaches. Um, 
then secondly, uh, because it's the idea is that it should be used in production. So basically, when the level designers are using it, it has to be you know live, uh, and it should not be prone to breaking down. So it has to be robust against that because if it breaks down, if they can't use it, it will end up um, you know, costing a lot of time both for the level designers but also for the game programmers or the people responsible for this. So the, the tool itself also has to be robust against this. And also, secondly, if there's something that if all of a sudden it doesn't know how to play the game, and you have to troubleshoot why, it also has to be easy to pinpoint why. Yeah, so that's a very important part of uh, this tool. Um, secondly, or lastly, is uh, you know, it has to be fast and accurate. So in this, uh, in this context, we wanted to be able to evaluate a new level in five minutes and you know, the completion rate is between zero and 100%, then, then it has to fit it within you know, 10, minus uh, plus minus 10 percent accuracy of this completion rate so that's just the overall goal this is something at least for evaluation data but so the approach that we have chosen to go with is basically a two component approach um, and uh, this is also maybe where i think this is something that makes sense in a company context uh, because um, it's a uh, well, I will explain it a bit, but it's it, it it's a bit more robust uh, compared to, for example, getting something to play like a player. Uh, so I'll just explain the idea first. And the first step is that you have this play testing agent. In this case, I use a deep reinforcement learning agent. Um, and just to start with, I don't know, uh, really what technical level I should uh, uh, keep this on, but uh, I'll just, uh, I'll hope it still allows for some discussion afterwards. But um, it uses a deep reinforcement learning approach, uh, proximal, and it uses uh, the proximal policy optimization method uh, because it tends to be robust and, and stable. You don't have to fine tune all the hyperparameters and so on. Um, and we use it for a you know, in a custom environment of this Lily's Garden game. So we just consider one game and one agent. Um, and then what we use this playtesting agent for is we record at the moment just the number of moves spent to complete the level. So what it would look like, uh, how it looks in a concrete example is we have level 120 and you can see how many moves that the players spent. And you can see there's a sharp cutoff here because that's that's where um, uh, the move limit is. And you can see that then the agents that we have tried to use to evaluate this level, it's, they tend to spend a bit more, uh, it looks like. But first, uh, so one thing is that, okay, they are not really playing it on a human level, but secondly, it's, also, it's fine because uh, what we can see is that um, if we just consider how many moves that it takes, so that's down here. So we take how many moves that they spend. And if we look at the, for example, for the one step curriculum up here, so that is the orange, um, you can see that, you know, there's still some correlation with how many moves that this agent takes. So if we just consider the 10% best moves, it's around here. There's still a, cor a big correlation with, um, um, with the actual player completion rate. So what this says is basically, there's a correlation between how many moves the agent spends, regardless of how effective or good it is, and uh, the player completion rate. So that is what we basically want to use to model uh, the completion rate further. But this is still work in progress. And uh, this is also the two overall topics that I think I would like some feedback on. First of all, this playtesting agent, is it reasonable the way that it functions now? What can we do to improve it? And then secondly, how do we do this player modeling a bit more effectively? And uh, as for the agent making it better, uh, we 
there's still some work on trying to you know fully represent the game. It's uh, right now we just use some game mechanics or descriptions of the tiles, but maybe there's some other information that is not enough to describe the the board. For example, maybe there's uh, some strategy to, that you need to uh, learn and how exactly that is done or ideas to improve that is something that I'm still trying to figure out uh, how to do that in a good way. And then secondly, because the idea is that the agent is supposed to be able to play new levels. So we have the old levels and we try to train the agent on that, but the important performance is really how well does it perform when you then want to evaluate new levels. So the the way that the agent plays levels has to be consistent with, uh, it has to be consistent on both new and old levels because that's what we use in the player modeling aspect. We, we need it to play consistently and that is something that some of these approaches kind of struggle with. So that's also, that's the main research at least that I want to focus on now is how to better generalize this player agent uh, further. and. Um, I have a couple of ideas. Um, I don't have time to go into detail all of them, but one is basically having some kind of diversity, so it learns some overall, some you know, some intrinsic motivation to learn new things and and not get too stuck on like playing in a specific way. And then secondly, also maybe more importantly, to look at how to create a curriculum for this agent because as new levels are being introduced, how do we really know how much time to train on that, um, those levels without, you know, making it forget how it plays earlier levels or how to enforce the skills that it learns. How, how can we select levels in a way that, you know, supports that? And then the, the second part that is important, but uh, at least uh, comes after this is this player modeling thing. So how can we improve the predictions? So for that, I think what I would, the, it's uh, the immediate thing that I want to work on now is basically finding out what is important for modeling the completion rate. Um, in some works, they take the completion rate of the agent and then have some linear regression or something or logistic regression. And they take some information about what board pieces are on the level. And maybe that's, you know, good enough, but what other things do we need to uh, could improve on these predictions? Could it be uh, somehow estimating the log or randomness of the level, uh, maybe through the agent or uh, what, what other information could be vital for this? And then maybe secondly also, we kind of want to understand the distribution of this uh, 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 player, uh, the moves spent, because I think that's pretty, interesting to if if we can parameterize how players and the agent how how many moves they would spend then you know maybe there's some deeper connection between them um, so that is also something that we want to look into next and um, yeah that is basically that uh, i put some discussion points that i think could serve as uh, you know feedback now um, but yeah that is basically it Okay, thank you, Jeppe. And well, I mean, uh, Henrik, I think you can go right into. Um, yes, I am sorry. I'm, I'm going to disappoint you a little bit here. I'm not really going to talk much about the technical solution that you're working on. No, I think fine. there's a, a more interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, so when I, I read your text primarily, because that's what I had before this, mm -hmm. um, you talk about the robustness and finished systems and uh, mature states for mm -hmm. this thing that's supposed to be able to generally test a lot of different games. Yeah. So I recognize that your, your, your situation is different because you're an industry of PhD students. You probably have, you're still working with the company and you're also doing your PhD at the same time. So you're, you're, you're sort of, you're, the possibility space is a little bit different for you, but generally I have to, I have yet to see robust code emerge from a PhD project. Hmm. If it runs, we usually call that great. If it runs most of the time, we usually call that good. Hmm. So, um, 
I think you, you may need to talk, may talk a little bit about controlling expectations, especially if you're looking at something pretty difficult as making it generally capable of testing even future games, right? Mm -hmm. uh, part of that may be also that so you don't overpromise to your employer and they, they end up being disappointed in what came out of this PhD project mm -hmm. in terms of strategy. Uh, so making sure that your your so people invested in this process are actually still being satisfied with the outcome. Um, I have one tricky question here. Yes. When you are designing this set of agents, um, I, I mostly in point two here uh, with how does leads to valuable research. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that it avoids producing just cookie cutter games? If you want to test future games with it. How do you avoid the cookie cutter problem that it ends up being just another tile game or just another game that's sort of the same thing, but a little tweaked with different graphics? Um, well, so, I mean, okay, just to try and completely understand the, the reasoning mm -hmm. behind that. Uh, right now, I know, for example, tactile games, they, they, tend to have a few, like three variations of this match three mm -hmm. thing. And then the, the interesting question is maybe how you would then use this approach or uh, on these other games or future games or, uh, well, I, I mean, the, the in, in some ways, so what I did, uh, some of the first research I looked at was basically also using a PPO agent, but just the strategies, like what can you do? What kind of input would you expect? So uh, the, you know, it was more strategies for using it. So kind of like, okay, you can do this, uh, uh, you can use this input uh, as a color thing and then shuffle it around, or you can uh, make sure that you limit the time that it runs. So you can, uh, uh, you can do it, a couple of things uh, to kind of give general advice on how you would use it, uh, PPO in a um, in this context. Uh, but of course, I only looked at one case and what worked for that, so I didn't really extend that research as such. Uh, but uh, th that was um, there's actually one paper I have at this conference uh, also. Mm -hmm. um, so. Well, as it is right now, it's not something that you just take from one game and then apply it to another because it requires some more resources in any case. It requires some developer time from tactile right. to yeah. translate that. And um, in a way, I think also what kind of is characteristic of uh, companies or if you use machine learning in mm -hmm. any kind of machine learning in uh, in the industry, it tends to just be very limited to one problem and you can train a model or whatever on that. And then you just do the same process. You, you don't really reuse so much, maybe just the overall architecture, but you know, you just, um, uh, it's easier to just, well, it worked on the first approach in this topic. Let's just reuse it on another problem and it works fine. There's not any deeper connection between the two. Right some good synergy, like all this transfer learning that you could train it on one game and maybe have some kind of uh, yeah, encode the input or something and then use it for another or you save the weights from one model to another and it learns faster. I mean, that is an option that you could have and it would then learn or it would reach a level of competence much faster, but it's not always something that, you know, practically, uh, whether it works or not is, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, uh, you could so do it. Yeah, uh, so. This is, I mean, it's a known really difficult problem to have a, a general game playing agent. I mean, that's sort of one of the holy grails of, of current AI research, right? Mm -hmm. So well, the reason I asked the question was to understand, does, uh, does Tactile make one sort of game that seems like they kind of make match three games, much like yeah. some companies just make slot machines, right? Um, mm -hmm. So the question is, what is the scope of games that you need to encompass with this system? You, I think you need to think about that and maybe make that a little bit cl more clear and maybe also a little uh, more well-defined because that'll make mm -hmm. it easier for you to define exactly what you're doing when you're also publishing on this and, and sort of getting feedback from others. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it'll make it easier to discuss what you're actually after. And I think it'll, in the longer, if we look at this from the academic side, finishing the thesis will make it easier. It will be easier if you have that scope well-defined from the get-go. Yeah, I think uh, it is only just in one game to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, and then um, maybe there are other games, they will release a new game soon, but it's basically the same game and they re reduce the same levels. So mm. in that sense, it doesn't require so much. But with that said, that's the agent. Uh, there's also the player modeling aspect. Mm -hmm. And um, that is not something I have thought that much about yet, because it's, um, or at least how you would use it in different contexts. Um, yeah, that's um, you, you would probably require some kind of player data to really be able to model it afterwards. Because what what I find also is that there are some of these uh, game playing agent uh, methods that you know. Then you can have an explorer agent. Then you can have a minimize a min maxer or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them work to exp uh, explore some points of the game design, but other parts of the game design, like level difficulty, where you kind of need a, a an exact estimate or you know produce a number that is completely correlated with the players, is not. I mean, you can't just uh, the the agent has different biases and strengths compared to uh, players, so there needs to be some kind of um, yeah, modeling afterwards of whatever the agents do. And I, I think that's the the main point here. But yeah. could go back. You had a, 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 I think it was a bar chart or a line chart. Uh, go back a little bit. There we go. Uh, forward again. Yes, level 120. You were confused about that gray spike and why that distribution is the way it is, if I understood you correctly. Like you didn't, the, as a company, you didn't really understand how that well, distribution happened. Well, to some extent, I think we, you, uh, you you can explain it at least, uh, you know, well, you can explain the overall features, for example, that you have to cut off. That's the move limit. But for example, um, what, what we would think that it would follow is this negative binomial distribution. But why exactly is it, um, where exactly is the peak and, and how, how does this information help us? Um, like, what well, if we can use a binomial distrib negative binomial distribution to model the players or the level? Um, what does it really say these parameters about the level then? And that's not something that uh, has really been explored in tactile or other uh, research as far as I can see. Also, because tip Typically, they don't want to show these kind of distributions because it's kind of like company secrets. Yeah, but, uh, it ends up being a trade secret. Yeah, yeah. I, I would, I assume tactile, I don't know how big tactile is, uh, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with them, but if they have some level of, of user research going on, I would recommend that you speak to those people, mm -hmm. uh, unless you are those people, uh, because speaking to yourself would maybe be kind of pointless because you already know everything. Uh, but they try to figure out how they characterize the players when they start, when the designers design levels, what do they the criteria they use for creating difficulty and mm -hmm. see how you can use that, use that to inform your modeling of this somehow. Yeah, I think uh, it is, I know some people that kind of work with this, but it's more reactive. It's not so predictive. There are some, you know, you, you try to model lifetime value of the uh, mm -hmm. players or something, but that's just based on the purchase history. It, uh, it doesn't really relate to any like player personas or anything. And there was some work on that. Uh, the Tactile Games has a good collaboration with the, the IT university. So they tend to share or get students to do some mm -hmm. work sometimes. So, and there was some research in what kind of player models or player personas we have, but uh, it wasn't really something that was used much further. And otherwise, it's just for this level difficulty, you just know that the people that reach these levels or so the latest levels first, the end of content users, they are more skilled. So the level difficulty will seem lower or yeah, it will seem easier at first. And then it slowly as more people reach it, uh, the level difficulty, if you look at the completion rate, will 
slowly increase as the less skilled players come. But I think that's as far as the modeling goes. It's more reactive and you can kind of see how how I it think, is. Uh, I think unfortunately we were actually out of time. It was Hartmut's looking a little comfortable here, but uh, I think you could use those, what the, the personas that you found, you could use those as at least be the, the types of agents that you use to uh, model something in your system. Right. So you can use that to create your, your family of agents that test out, test out the difficulty of this. And that would also give you so kind of a, right now you seem to be shooting at a moving target. Mm -hmm. If you can nail down the target, it'll be easier to hit because now you know what you're looking for. For building a level that we aim at early stage users, then it will need to serve. We want this kind of distribution. Mm -hmm. If we are uh, maybe of, of elements or of success or how they finish, uh, how, they, how many moves they finish. If we're moving, if we're moving towards more late game, so for the existing game, then we probably want to model it on for this group of users. And you probably don't want one single model to rule them all. You probably want multiple sub models, so it's easier to actually have this uh, because it's it's a smaller problem to solve, and you solve multiple small problems instead of one big problem. Also, mm. incidentally, more publishable because you don't you can sort of you have the salami and it's naturally split up into chunks that's communicable. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. But I think we are officially out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I mean, we will also uh, always have time to continue more. That's also what the um, Discord is for, absolutely. Um, but yes, indeed, and thanks for being mindful um, of the time. And uh, with that, I like to ask uh, Diogo, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, to start with the next presentation. Perfectly. It was really well pronounced. <laughs> Usually people fall into the Diego category, but they're not <laughs> used to the Portuguese one. So thanks for that. Uh, let me share the screen to see if it works. Are you seeing it? Not yet? Nope. And now? Yes. Yes, okay. Sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, my name is Jok Hart. I'm from Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, and just a heads up, I'm not really at the start of my PhD. I'm almost in my second niche year. Uh, but the first year was completely about uh, trying to, to get a stronger grasp between uh, games and social sciences. So I did not publish that many things, but uh, at least I gained a lot of knowledge in the way. So my, my topic for my thesis is procedurally generated society. And the goal of my work uh, is uh, to, to try to create better NPCs at a social level. And why do we need such NPCs? And with recent games like the, the demo that Unreal showed earlier this year, the high fidelity of graphics, navigation, uh, and so much other systems that are uh, used in game development are so, their level is so high uh, that uh, we need to start shifting the, the effort towards different stuff, such as social behavior in characters. Um, and usually to create a more social experience for players, developers tend to rely on the huge um, altering effort. Uh, they need a lot of artists, a lot of game writers, to write huge stories uh, with uh, multiple relationships between characters. And that's the example of The Last of Us, the second game that recently was released. Tons and tons of dialogue lines that had to be written by someone. Uh, and with the, with the bend over of creating games with the procedural worlds, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we need to place uh, agents inside those, um, those uh, worlds. And with that, with new agents, with new characters, the interactive space and the, the, the possibilities that the world affords get even larger. But we are not really seeing uh, an effort towards endowing such characters with better uh, social capabilities, at least at this level, uh, across multiple characters within the whole game. And with that, uh, my, my, my inspiration for my PhD was a little bit Dwarf Fortress, the game. I don't know if you're aware, uh, but uh, I always liked to play the ASCII game. It was awful visually, 
But uh, besides that, uh, uh, I really uh, love the plot and, and all the, the narrative that was simulated and generated on the spot. And it was really thrilling to explore those worlds. But you never really face, you never interacted face to face with the characters. And I want to place the player in that level, at the same level as the other characters, as a peer, not uh, through the, the high level lens that uh, games such as Dwarf Fortress or SimCity allows you to inspect the, the social world in the game. And of course, um, the goal of the thesis, after all, is to, to create better and more intelligent social NPCs. And from the academia side, there have been some efforts throughout the last decades, uh, Facade from Michael Matias uh, and uh, Camille Faux that uh, was employed in Prom Week and in a, a modding of, um, of Skyrim in C CK but also more on the text, text adventures uh, in Verso and Blood Laura's, uh, Emily Short and Richard Evans uh, worked a lot in generating such plots that emerge from rich social uh, networks of characters, within characters. Uh, and I don't think that such approaches can scale to, to the worlds that we are seeing in games like No Man's Sky or Minecraft, uh, but uh, it's a good starting point to, to to learn something at least and try to to look forward to a better uh, network of social NPCs in games. And that's more or less what I want to do uh, in by the end of my doctoral program. I want to be able to automatically create groups of socially coherent NPCs in games. And this might be a, a, a sentence with uh, a lot of power uh, that requires a lot of effort. But just to visualize what I really want to uh, see as my final contribution of this PhD thesis is more or less having multiple characters uh, playing their parts in across multiple scenarios, the horizontal axis. And I want to see the characters being capable of uh, showing consistent and uh, consistent behavior at an individual level across each one of these scenarios, while for each scenario, people adapt uh, in a similar way uh, collectively. And yeah, this is more or less the, the aim. And we have already started working in some of uh, the points and I'd like to split the, the work in three research goals. The first one is understanding societies in games, what players perceive as being a, a society inside a game. Do they, do they pay more attention to the physical aspect of characters, to their behavior, to the way they navigate and so on? and then to create a social cognitive model for NPCs. And this part was the first part of my, my work. We contributed with the conceptual model uh, for uh, agents in games. And lastly, but not, uh, last but not least, the most important part, actually generating these societies in games. And with the knowledge from the two first uh, research goals, I expect to, to be able to do a, a better job at informing the, the methodology to, to generate such societies in games. And regarding the first one, understanding societies in games, the goal uh, more or less is to, to see what aspects contribute to the unification of a society in game. Putting us at, the, play, at the, the, the shoes of the player, we want to look into the characters, moving around, interact with them, and feel uh, how they adapt, if they adapt to the social context around or not, uh, how the player perceives and attributes the social motivations to the character's actions and behavior, and if the physical characteristics of each uh, character uh, plays a more important role than the actual behavior of the character. If people are able to identify such groups of characters in games as being closer together, if they share the same physical characteristics or behavior. Um, and we already laid some foundations to, to conduct a series of user-centered studies. We already conducted two of them and we developed a very minimalistic scenario inspired by either and Simul from the 40s. Uh, that studied anthropomorphism. So we removed all the anthropomorphic characteristics of the characters. And the idea is that each room represents a social context. Each one has a token and uh, the characters move between them and they can change colors. They can change the way they walk, their gait, uh, the way they navigate. And we then uh, evaluate, um, we have multiple conditions of course, uh, and we evaluate which ones have more uh, salience to the players. And we evolved a little bit this scenario. It started as, as this one. Then we started to, to do something a little bit more uh, clean uh, and beautiful. Uh, we removed the, the tokens from the, the room to the floor. 
and we started introducing different agents to see if a character, the one on the top uh, left corner, uh, is moving between rooms, if he adapted to the room, uh, if when he adapted to the room was more uh, salient from the, the perceiver side than when uh, adapted to the actual characters inside the room. And, and this is more or less the line of research we are conducting in this first go is to better understand how players identify societies in games and what aspects of such societies are deemed as important to the creation of, of these social entities. Uh, secondly, the, the second research goal, if I was able to change slides, yeah, uh, is to create a social cognitive model for NPCs. We already proposed one, uh, and the goal was more or less create NPCs that guide their behavior based on the social reality, their context, without disregarding their own personal preferences and their drives, their motivations, their aspirations. So it should be a, an hybrid way where they have their own drives, but they also take into account the surroundings. And we, we inspired a lot in some uh, social psychology theories and uh, the theory of forces by Gibson, the social identity theory. Uh, and we come up with, with a model uh, called cognitive social frames, which uh, relates a, a social context which has a set of features with a set of affordances that, that enable the character to act in a certain way in that environment. And as I said, we developed a conceptual model um, for NPCs. We have not yet employed it fully as we intend to. Uh, but just to, be, to give a, a little bit of an overview, the model is something like this. It's an agent-based model. You have perceptions, you have actions, uh, and each agent has a set of mappings between the social reality, the social context, and the affordances. And depending on their interpretation of the social context, they deploy these affordances. And alongside some decision-making algorithms, whether an emotional appraisal one, a planning, a logic one, they select from the affordances the one that fit the situation the best. And third, the third research goal is actually generating the societies in games. And this could be uh, described as uh, finding out which algorithms and methodologies we can use to generate coherent groups of game characters that are perceived of members of societies in games. And in a way, what we, what I want to do is to generate uh, cognitive social frames for NPCs that can represent adequate behavior for certain game contexts, certain social game contexts, inside the same game, of course, and distribute them uh, among all the characters towards creating multiple, multiple and distinctive groups of characters. And um, in comparison with the, with the other two research goals, I don't have a, a single image to show you here because this is the part uh, I'm not uh, sure what I want to do, or I know what I want to do, I don't know how to do it, uh, and that's the beauty of research. Uh, but I was hoping for some feedback uh, during this doctoral consortium regarding this. And just to summarize a little bit, I expect by the end of the thesis to, to have a better understanding um, of players' perception of social NPCs, a, a model for social adequate behavior, the one we proposed, cognitive social frames, and also the techniques to procedural generate societies in games. And this last part is the one that requires more effort from us that we haven't yet uh, employed a lot of things into this. Um, yeah, I don't know if I went a little bit over time, but this is it. Um, I hope to hear some comments, some feedback, some backlash about my approach, if needed. All right, thank you. And yeah, Henrik, what do you have to tell us? Well, first of all, I find it's really interesting. This is very similar to what I did during my PhD including the getting to the point where you go, I know what I want to do, but how do I do this? I have no idea. And I suspect that's where you feel that you are right now. And I was at, at about the same point at about the same point in my PhD, so to speak. Nice, uh, if we, nice to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not alone. This, is, this seems to be okay. a fairly common thing when you're trying to do this. Uh, if you back up a little bit to the yeah. first uh, research goal that you had, we'll talk about this in, in order. Um, here, uh, adaptation of, to the social context. Um, so you, in, in the paper you would write about believable society. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? 
Yeah, so that's the question. Questions. Underlying this research goal is to understand yeah. what people perceive as being uh, a believable society, what factors, with what aspects of the, the environment, the actions, the group uh, can be used to describe uh, a society, a believable society. And I believe that the modality of games requires different uh, aspects than from our actual uh, real world. So mm. placing these characters in a virtual world will um, will raise different expectations of what's socially believable than the real world. If we skip on to the next one, because yeah. this, this connects. Uh, My computer is so slow, I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Uh, you can keep all the text on there. Yeah. Just to... All right, so theory of forces and social identity theory. Um, these two kind of tied together, right? Because you're, 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 you yeah. first you asked, is it the visual part or is it the behavior part? Yeah. And you all, you're also kind of asking, what it, what are these is it that makes these seem like they're in a society? And there seems to be behavior. You I mean you're you're taking you're taking the affordances approach, which I also did, which I think is a sane approach for this. Yeah. Um, but there's a little problem here, and that is, what how exactly do we signal an affordance? And something that is really tricky with non pay characters and how they're represented is that the contextualization and the situation of the user plays such a huge role in what we expect. So you said that you enjoyed Dwarf Fortress and especially the ASCII version. Have you thought about why you enjoyed the ASCII version and not the GUI version? Yeah, the expectations regarding the visuals when, when I started playing, like it was early these decades, were quite high. And when I faced an ASCII game, I was not, the, the expectations were not matching the 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 actual game world but from my perspective what i enjoyed about dwarf fortress is the minimalistic approach to to the social dimension of the game you don't need really high fidelity graphics uh mocap animations for characters you just need a good story and they are able to convey that to the to the player in a not so usual uh way but the, the whole mechanism behind it, the one that generates the story, it's also something that really appealed to me. So have you played RimWorld? Yes, yes. 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 The, RimWorld is kind of similar to War Fortress. Yeah. It, it works. It's very much more complex graphically than, than Dwarf Fortress is because it's yeah. not ASCII, it's actual graphics. But yeah. it's still not necessarily very complex. No. The reason that these two seem to work, and this is what I've found, at least when I did research on this, is that simplistic representation also seems to reflect a simplistic uh, expectation on behavior. So when yeah. you have these like fully realized 3D characters, people expect them to emote in a much different way than an ASCII character or these simple 2D like stacked sprites. Yeah. So when you transfer this into the, the bigger domain of, of working with a fully realized 3D character, they have to act out much more and they have to be like Ellie from, from Last from of Us, right? Us, yeah. To actually convey all the, the 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 small the tone and all the the nuance that we expect from these characters, but we don't really expect nuance from from Dwarf Fortress characters or from Rimworld characters or from Case of Cud characters. For that, and what Jason Grimblatt is doing there with narrative is really interesting, because he's he has a super simple game, and presenting super simple narratives, and yet it works. Yeah because the expectations of the user is set to a level that where we go like, all right, the graphics, we, we kind of have to imagine a lot for the graphics. Let's just imagine it a lot for the narrative. Yeah. And, and to a extent, here. I know he's done, he does narrative stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> but to a certain extent, you have an uncanny, an uncanny valley mm -hmm. the, for graphics that we try to, to overcome. And yeah. I think the industry is working towards that. It's almost yeah. at the level it, that you, you meet your expectations for a realistic character. Mm -hmm. But regarding uh, intelligent narrative or uh, intelligent social behavior and so on, I think we are still lacking. It's sort of a second oh, yeah. degree of the valley. Yeah, uh, I think that's a really good way of, of putting it. There's an uncanny valley for, especially for, for narrative, but also for generative narrative, because that's much more complicated yeah. because we as humans have all these weird expectations on how these systems should work and then they fail to do that. And we go like, that's weird. Yeah. And it kind of tosses it out, out of it. Um, the thing is that what you're looking at here on a broader scope, you are kind of trying to find the Holy grail for NPC research. 
<laughs> which is, is, is a laudable goal. I, I'm not sure you're going to do that in one PhD thesis. Yeah. Uh, but then again, I didn't, so maybe I'm just not, <laughs> not very good at it. But uh, I think there's, um, if you keep these to simple simulations, you're probably going to f be able to find more useful stuff to lay foundational theory that's still lacking. Okay. Than if you uh, move this, move too quickly into this AAA production thing or the production qualities thing, which is, you know, you, you can do like by a double A, single A kind of production stuff, right? Uh, in Unity fairly easily, uh, fairly cheaply, but it still takes a lot more time than having simple graphics like you would in say, Remoral or Dwarf Fortress. And I think you can learn more through that strategy. And I think that's more doable with the time you have in a PhD to, to focus more, focus more narrowly on a set of games where you can get more data out of it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And on the other end, I've been struggling a, a little bit to publish the things I've worked on mm -hmm. because they are never closed. They are always work in progress. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to look for this holy grail, right, so to yeah. say, and I need to publish in the midterm to, mm -hmm. to get feedback, to know, to, to report and so on for, for financing reasons, for funding, <laughs> uh, but- uh, For academia reasons. For academia, yeah. <laughs> that's life. <laughs> <laughs> Such as life, unfortunately. I, I would, I would do this. Try to see what kind of theory you have. You have some some theory you're published on. Let's see what you can do with a small little prototype and do a, do a user test of that. That should be publishable as a publishable unit. And then you build, you get feedback on that, and you build on that. I mean, you're probably going to do one as you're getting feedback on the other, but you can yeah. sort of do this iteratively for a little bit, and do a couple of those, and that should give you enough papers and enough signs done to actually qualify for the PhD. And then you can continue this line of inquiry afterwards because I, I don't think you're going to find the answer for this. By the end, a PhD seems like a long time, but it really isn't. No, no, <laughs> no. Because a lot of this is also spent like learning how to science mm. and, and how to write and all that. Uh, and especially for those of us who are like, who, are, who don't speak English as a first language, we also have to learn how to write science yeah. in English. And that's not yeah. super easy either. Um, so I think that Focusing right now on the algorithms that will be used in games uh, to create coherent groups of silk characters in games. Um, I'm not sure you should be doing that just now. You should be focusing on making small societies okay. and adding on little, little things like stepping up. This is incidentally the strategy I'm using for my own research. So that's, that's what it's based on, what this advice is based on. I think in terms of um, something that you could find useful is if you look at the concept of character by um, Jan Lert and Stolterman, or Jan Lert and okay. Stolterman, if you happen to speak Bork, uh, where they talk about character. And that's, so it's, it's an HCI theory that describes how we understand things that we're presented with. Okay. And I think you could hook that into affordances, especially because that's an H, also HCI, with social identity theory, especially, and see how we can use that kind of theory to manipulate how people understand social connectedness. Okay. I also look into symbolic interactionism mm -hmm. uh, and th the things that appealed to me the most from those theories w mm -hmm. were the fact that for a game designer, it's pretty easy to, to specify the behavior they intend the characters to have. Mm -hmm. So they have a clear picture. It is symbolic. It is a place X do Y and it's pretty clear the mapping. And all, almost all of these theories, they rely on such concepts, so such clear concepts to, to employ characters with, uh, with this sort of knowledge. And I'm just trying to, to pick up. And as you said, I'm trying to move this a little bit forward. Uh, mm -hmm. I know the, the end is quite, uh, for my PhD, is not that far away, but uh, I don't expect to, to create a AAA, No Man's Sky with people in there. I just want to to lever leverage a little bit the knowledge I got mm -hmm. into the previous years into something computational. Yeah. Uh, do we have 10 more minutes, right? Or am I? We have? Okay. I think so. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. So yeah. Just, well, just I mean, we, we sort of are, but I mean, uh, of course, I don't know what, what you would um, say to that, Henrik, but Yep. Uh, what do you think about also looking into Miriam Eladhari's oh, uh, yep. research? Yes. Um, yes. I mean, her PhD was, was focused sort of, in a sense, on a similar problem, but not for NPCs, for PCs. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. But also on a, like the scale of society. Okay. So can, can I, you just I, repeat the name? Sorry. Well, I just sent you her PhD in, a, in okay. the private chat. <laughs> okay. Okay. So if you, you go back to the to. The, fi- the slide you had about uh, your final part here. I'm going to connect to this what Hart just said because I think that's a really good idea. This one. And and yes. and so I, I send you two of her. I sent her her PhD and a short piece uh, um, uh, that's called the Pataphysic Institute. And that was a research prototype which was focused on sort of, well, the emotions of PCs. And I think her prototype worked for up to, I think, 1,300 players or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'll take a look into it. So, look, uh, again, it's hers is about PCs, but she worked with Michael Matias uh, on that. There's also some papers with, with, between Michael and her. And and I have a feeling some of that could be used also for the NPC question. But I'm okay. I'm less of an AI expert, as you probably understand by now. But since Henrik seems to agree, I feel pretty good in recommending that. Oh yeah, thank you. So, thank Lucky, you so much. you've already found some of Matthias's work, and that's a gold mine to be digging in. <laughs> uh, okay. With Miriam Elhari, there's one thing I should mention here, and that is something called the black hole of AI, which is also a paper of Miriam's, incidentally, with. Uh, Magnus Johansson and Harker Verhagen, who I, I did my PhD with. Uh, and the black hole of AI is that you have this enormous hole that after a while you, you get to a point where you can toss inordinate amounts of tech resources at a, an AI problem and you're not getting anywhere with believability. So it seems like the, the solution to most AI problems is not, is not lobbying tech at it, or at least for believe of social AI. It's lobbying theory at it. Yeah. So you need to understand what you're, what you're trying to create, which I think you've encountered now that you get like, okay, but how do I build this? Yeah. So it, it turns out that most of this is a theory problem, not a tech problem. So tech will probably be fairly simple. I don't know if you were in the UX of AI workshop, but Tommy Thompson. I was part of it, yeah. Yeah, talk, did you hear Tommy talk about the alien and uh, alien isolation? Alien, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's fairly simple. It's just exactly. the understanding how it works, understanding the dynamics. For those, for those who weren't there, uh, what the, one example he used was that people, the alien has a tail. If you've seen the alien movie, you know what we're talking about, the xenomorph thing. Uh, and the alien has a tail. And all the play, players kind of assumed that there was some kind of advanced collider physics thing going on with that tail. Could, could, it could detect a player. It turns out they're just casting, like basically drawing a line between the head of the, the, the alien and the tip of the tail. And if that intersected with the player, their player model, the alien had seen them. And it's a super elegant, simple, cheap to run solution. But it made it seem like this alien could sense its tail and, you know, when things were nearby and all that. People ascribe these things to very simple tech. Yeah. So I think diving deep into like the algorithms that generate this is less interesting than finding an algorithm, that will, finding some tech that will just do it. And then we can later on make it nice. Yeah, I agree with that. And the thing I got from these user-centered studies I've been conducting is that using such a minimalistic environment, people ascribe, usually I, I ask open questions uh, at the end of each video so that they can use their own world, words to describe what they saw. And people ascribe stuff that it's mind-blowing. There is an employee following uh, his employer trying to, to ask for money. And it's just Crazy. They are just boxes changing colors, moving around between rooms. And that was clever. It was impressive. Yeah, the human mind is a weird place. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and, and we go looking for patterns. All, like, but we can't resist looking for patterns. Yeah. And in this case, we'll make up little narratives to make those patterns fit. Yep. Uh, and I think that, that's something that you really play on to make this seem like there's an actual society happening even though there's not really a society happening. Like it's just, they just yeah. change their color or, you know, wear the same uniform. We are just creating, trying to identify the minimal set of aspects that will enable the player to create their own society in the game. Yeah, and I think that is a, like you could, if you wanted to scale this up, you could have a little creatures and they just change the color of their clothing depending on which tribe they belong to. And then you can yeah. see if people describe different emotions to that. Yep. yep. Yeah, I mean, I think all of that is is very true. And um, well, I've uh, I've been telling people that well, stagecraft is okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, oh, yeah, everybody agrees with that, of course. 
you know it does might not mean that everything is very elegant computationally but I mean, it's also a bit of a question, are you focused on the user experience and, uh, or are you focused on sort of the, the back end? Yeah. And, and the user experience depends very entirely on the user's perception and we can ascribe, users can ascribe all kinds of things. Very yeah, easy. I, I'm can... more leaning towards that side, trying to, yeah. to understand uh, the experience rather to create intelligent uh, and beautiful algorithms to 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 create this behavior. Mm. I, I mean, that, that will that's of course an, another problem. But that you know, um, well, Michael once gave a keynote at IKEA 2010 in which he was rather disgruntled that that uh, many people seem not to fully appreciate the, the what what's going on algorithmically behind the scenes in facade. So he basically yeah. said, oh, in my next work, I want all these kind of like, you know, sliders and level meters and other things so people can actually understand the hard work that's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, and that's the frustration of the game designer when putting yes. so much effort into that. And mm -hmm. if the person on the other side is not able to grasp it. Yep. And, and I mean, so he showed, I think, some early uh, mock-up of, of um, Prom Week, but... Um, I also had a conversation with, with Mike Tremor, who, who basically then persuaded um, uh, uh, Michael down again, because it was just became totally confusing with, with all of these things going on and all showing how great yeah, all of yeah. that is and, and, and everything. But yes, that, that shows a bit of, of that one. Okay, good. Um, I mean, if you want to have a conversation about narrative, I'm also very happy to have that. Um, I also happen definitely. to write a book about interactive narrative for Rutledge right now. So um, I'm totally in the midst of it. And uh, yeah, um, um, but, but maybe let's not go into a narrative too much. Um, I think I can say one thing. Uh, I'm one of these people who is deeply convinced that interactive narrative is not the same than traditional forms of narrative plus interactivity. And that's what, what open go, often goes wrong when, when people talk uh, about narrative in, in games and other interactive forms. Okay. All right. Um, and Sorry, we, do you have you anything me. more? Or? Yes, I, I should listen to Hartman about narrative because building society is building narrative. So you're building a narrative of society. That's important to remember. I should say to both of you that I've just mentored here, or at least allegedly mentored, uh, that if you have any more questions, you want to discuss something, just send me a message on, on Discord and I'll be happy to talk to you and if I can get, offer any more help. Okay, thank you very much for the time now. You're welcome. Thank you. So, so next one up in, in our schedule um, is um, uh, Gabriella, who was originally supposed to be monted by Scott. And as I men uh, mentioned earlier, Scott unfortunately got really uh, dragged into a whole uh, COVID issue uh, himself and his family. Um, but I was able to get uh, Rebecca Rouse um, to do um, basically um, a review of, of uh, your proposal. But uh, with that, uh, it's, it's all yours. Please um, tell us about your research plans. I guess I'm un unmuted now. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me well? Yes. <laughs> I am delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. In the next five, six minutes, I will well, get an overview about a PhD research proposal that covers the theme of uh, aesthetic intersections between different digital artifacts and how they impact our present day visual culture. So, the main inspiration for this project have been, of course, the recent development of digital entertainment forms, uh, such as animation and video games. In particular, I think that one of the first studies that I have found incredibly inspiring has been the one of Bolter and Grusin of the early 2000s, I guess it was. Um, they analyze uh, different digital and non-digital media in their media ecosystem, which to me was a very interesting viewpoint. After that, I have, um, well, I got to know also, uh, 
another analysis of the phenomenon that is the one of Janet Morey that instead proposed, proposed not to uh, think about a media ecosystem, but instead of a single digital medium. That is to say, all different digital artifacts such as animation, computer games, uh, even TV series that employ digital techniques are to be considered part of the same digital medium, which I found very fascinating. Another, um, um, well, field of study that has helped me a lot developing my proposal is the one of the media studies, in particular the research carried out by uh, Susanna Tosca and Elizabeth Klastrup. In their last publication, they have analyzed um, the audience reception, I guess, and the, the um, role and the growing relevance of uh, entertainment industries in our visual culture. Um, and by visual culture, I mean our everyday lives. In fact, uh, whereas uh, in 1985, uh, digital entertainment forms were mostly part of a niche, um, just like the more classic example, I guess, is the gamers one. Nowadays, everyone is a little bit involved in some forms of digital popular entertainment forms. So, um, whereas there has been a growing scholarly discussion on the aesthetic dimension of video games, of animation, of digital media, what I believe lacks uh, is a comparative analysis between those. So we have already stated that there is a media ecology, but I think that we are not employing a systematic, systematically a comparison between different art forms. And therefore, my proposed questions are the following. The first one is how can we identify the mutual interchanges between different digital artifacts? And the second one is to what extent do they impact our visual culture and also allegedly our social practices? In order to answer this first, these two questions, I will perform a mixed methodology analysis. For what concerns the first one, I propose to uh, perform a literature review, that is to say, considers the major publications that cover aesthetic, uh, uh, the aesthetic dimension of digital media, and more specifically, the aesthetic of animation and of video games, uh, which uh, are my, um, well, so to say, my case studies for uh, this PhD project. After that, uh, um, I hope to um, name and pin down a set of criteria that could help me identify a methodology to analyze uh, potentially every digital artifact. Once I have uh, written down this methodology, I will employ it to analyze uh, two different digital artifacts, that is to say to, um, to perform a comparative analysis between, in my case, a video game and an animated series. Well, not really, sorry, not really an animated series, like more of a couple of animated movies, actually. In particular, I have, like, I propose to analyze uh, um, Breath of the Wild, possibly also the sequel of Breath of the Wild, uh, of the video game series, The Legend of Zelda, and uh, um, Studio Ghibli's animated movies. The reasons for this choice are that they are both recognized for their aesthetics. They are widespread, like literally they are the tip of the iceberg in their field. So this could help me a lot for conducting a reception analysis. And they have several common features, such as they are digitally produced and or mostly diffused. They have a growing audience online. They cover similar narratives and like not to dig too much into that hole, but they have similar narratives. and they also have several different themes. So I think they are mm, one of the best fit for this kind of analysis. Once I have completed my comparative analysis, uh, I hope to answer my first question. So I hope to have identified uh, these mutual interchanges. After this first part of the PhD, I will then perform uh, also in this case, a mixed methodology for what concerns the reception analysis. For this methodology, I propose to employ qualitative and quantitative methods. For what concerns the quantitative methods, I propose to analyze Twitter exemplar accounts in order to get an overlap between pool of users. I think that this could give me an indication, like a numeric indication on 
how digital media or the digital media that I am considering uh, are um, shaping the visual culture of their audience. After that, I will perform a qualitative analysis so that is that consists of a semantical analysis of YouTube comments and Reddit common threads. Because I believe that both the platforms allow the users to express themselves in a very freely way. And they are, of course, um, I am not asking them to do it. So I, I think I can really get their pure perception and their, just their free thoughts. So I'm really interested in this kind of analysis. But of course, I will then complete this qualitative analysis by performing one-on-one -on -one interviews to really get the insight on the issues that I want to cover. With this reception analysis, I hope that I will provide an answer to my second question, that is to say, to what extent digital artifacts shape our visual culture. So I think that for this PhD proposal, I hope to achieve three main goals. The first one is uh, identify my set of criteria to perform a comparative analysis that could be uh, employed ideally for every digital artifact. The second one is the um, comparative analysis itself that I believe consists of a result in itself. And the third one is the reception analysis that I believe that even if uh, in a very um, well, I think it's kind of the first steps that we are taking in this uh, um, kind of field of studies. In any case, I hope to get a grasp on the impact of digital technologies in our visual culture. If I have a couple of more minutes, I would like to... Okay, perfect. Because I would like to briefly discuss what are some of the limitations of my um, proposal that I really would love to hear your opinion about. So first of all, I have a big issue with terminology. I come from an art historical background. So the first publications that I have read were mostly art historically. And in art history, I have found that video games and animated movies, depending on the kind of industry they are talking about, named as art games uh, or uh, art pieces <laughs> or digital art, but of course digital art is also something else. Whereas in game studies I have found digital entertainment forms, digital popular arts, and to me it's just very confusing. And what I am scared of is that saying simply digital artifact does not convey the message that I want to convey. So this is my first issue with this proposal. The second one, is that when I started thinking about these ideas, of course, as I guess every PhD or wannabe PhD student, I haven't thought about a period of three years, but I have thought about my entire life. And I think it's a project that I could really carry on for 20 years before getting enough results to say, yes, we, they are actually shaping in like as a whole our visual culture. So the only escamotage that I found to propose this as a PhD project is to focus on a case study. And I wanted to ask you whether you find this uh, valuable in any case, or if you have any advice to improve this proposal. And thirdly, as I mentioned before, um, I come from an art historical background. Even though I have always studied social art and art history and like contemporary art history, um, Sometimes I fear that um, my background literature isn't as solid as it should be. And therefore I wanted to ask you if you know any uh, specific publication that is absolutely necessary for carrying out this kind of study because I have been studying a lot and like this has kept interest. Well, this has kept interesting me, I guess <laughs> it's the right way of saying this. Um, but the thing is that sometimes I fear that I don't know what is uh, the utmost important publication and what is uh, something else that isn't absolutely necessary for uh, creating a, a proposal that is really convincing. So I think that's all. Thank you very much for listening to this short presentation. And I am really looking forward to hearing your feedback. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I think I'd like to come back to your questions a little later, but first I, I, it's my duty to be uh, um, sort of a sounding board for um, 
Oh, I hope I find it now for Rebecca. Um, um, give me a second here. So, um, right, that should hopefully work. Um, <laughs> As always happens when you have too many windows open. Um, I mean, some people claim there's no such thing like too many windows. I'm one of them. Um, you but just don't have enough monitors. Yes, that is indeed true. But now I try to find the right... Oh, yeah. Here. There we go. So I just want to, to share this screen to, to basically alert to you who am I uh, speaking for. Uh, here right now, this is Rebecca Rouse. Um, 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 Rebecca um, has a PhD from the digital media program uh, at Georgia Tech, like me. Um, she actually worked with, with Jay Bolter um, and, and I worked with, with Janet Moore. Jay was my second advisor. Um, and that puts us into is interesting uh, positions regarding to, to what you said, of course, also from really personal experience talking to some of the protagonists that uh, uh, you mentioned. Um, Rebecca has recently moved from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in, in, in the US and is now a senior lecturer in media arts, aesthetics and narration in the School of Informatics at the University of Hrefta. Yes, it, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah. Henrik. Do I get a grade for this? Yes, uh, eight out of 10. Oh, okay, all right. Well, I mean, but, but I mean, it, I would pronounce this Skerfte, but you know, this is completely wrong, right? So, well so. okay, well okay. Good luck with that word. <laughs> Cruel. Okay. Okay, anyhow, so, um, and, and so now she has um, written uh, basically um, a nice little letter to you, and of course, I will also send it to you later. Dear Gabriele, thank you for sharing your interesting research proposal. As I understand it, you are curious to find out more about the flows of influences across cultures that st stem from different digital media artifacts such as video games and digital animated films. The proposal discusses, uh, discusses examining uh, the Zelda game franchise along with a se uh, selection of Studio Hilby films. It sounds like you will analyze these artifacts and their movement through popular culture in a variety of ways. Interfaces, aesthetic qualities, reception by users, which you propose to examine both by analyzing people's social media feeds and in conversation with people in interviews. It strikes me that there may actually be three dissertation projects here. One, an HCI art history examination of digital media interfaces to develop a set of design patterns for digital media, such as Christopher Alexander developed for architecture. See Alexander 1977, a pattern language, um, or 79, the timeless way of building. The ideas of patterns that you have in books like Patterns of a Game, a game Design by, by Björk and, and Holopine is, is also built on this idea of Alexander. Second, so that's the first PhD you can do, right? Art History HCI. A second one, an art historical analysis of digital media artifacts to compare and contrast their former character characteristics and influences in so society, such as Walter Benjamin's 1935 work of the art in the age of mechanical reproduction or John Berger's 1971 ways of seeing. So that's the second PhD. And the third one is a reception theory focused study on how people perceive the transmedial flows and influences of a range of digital artifacts. For example, how games influence films, films still generate memes, phrases enter popular culture slang, etc. Such as the research done by Henry Jenkins, 1992 Textual Poachers, and others. So, 
Rebecca is very clear here, basically, in saying, and I mean, you admitted that yourself, you know, I mean, you sort of give us a research program for the rest of your academic life, but for the, uh, for the PhD, you need to choose which one to do. So Rebecca continues, I believe your proposal would be further strengthened by choosing just one of these three approaches to work in, prim in, in primarily. And Chatterson, the other two completely for later further research after the dissertation. Once the focus of the research proposal is more narrowed, it will be an easier task for you to dive in to collect the relevant literature to support your investigation, which I think is part of a part of an answer to what you just basically asked us. Here are some other smaller questions and ideas I can share with. I uh, for further strengthening your proposal and work moving, uh, moving forward. Why set up Boulder and Grusin and Murray as if they represent opposing viewpoints? I would contend they are more in agreement than disagreement, we just carry out different projects. Boulder and Grusin are interested in tracing histories and flows across technologies and time periods, while Murray is specifically interested in examining the computer as a creative medium and unpacking its core qualities. Uh, me personally, I disagree here with Rebecca. Um, I see more of an antagonism than, than she sees and I, I live through this antagonism also as part of my PhD thesis with both uh, 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 Janet and Jay uh, being my advisors. So that, that's an interesting topic that could be uh, uh, further explored. I mean, I personally see it more like Janet thinks, um, um, uh, to very, make it very simple, uh, uh, Jay says there's nothing new under the sun and, and Janet says, yes, new things are possible. And I mean, you use different words, I think, to say the same thing. Um, but, but back to what Rebecca says, be sure to contextualize animation when you discuss it. I think you, you mean, uh, speci uh, I think you are especially interested in digital animation. I bring this up because the history of animation dates back to the birth of film in the late 1800s with popular animation examples surrounding the 1910s and, and 1920s. There is an even longer prehistory of animation with devices such as soriotropes, flipbooks, um, the mutoscope, etc. So, you know, make sure to, to clearly identify what you're talking about. Um, will interactivity and immersion be the core metrics for analysis of the artifacts you examine? If yes, these terms will need to be more deeply explored and defined because there are so many different ways of defining them. And I think I will come more to that a little bit. Um, um, also, that goes back to your question of, of literature and vocabulary. So how will you define, I'm going back to Rebecca, how will you define contribution impact of digital media, economic, political, aesthetic, or ontological impact, or some combination or more than one of these. You mention online as if separate from everyday life reality, but I'm not convinced that is the case anymore given the ubiquity of online presence via smartphones and other connected devices. You mention an interest in finding out if culture has a shared taste. Does that mean you are curious to find out if there is a dominant, unified, high culture anymore? If this is part of your project, it would be helpful to read some critical reception theory, such as Stuart Hall, 1973, and coding and decoding in the television discourse, and recent works such as Boulder's 2019, The Digital Plentitude, The Decline of Elite Culture and the Rise of New Media. If your focus is more on the nature of the digital image, it would be helpful to look at W.J.T. Uh, Mitchell's 2005, What Do Pictures Want? 
as well as look back as, at important essays by Sontag and Benjamin on the nature of photography. So Susan Sontag on photography, 77, Benjamin again, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. I think he has also some other smaller essays on, on that topic. Um, these works could help you think through and theorize what precisely you mean by a digital image. It is an image delivered, is it an image delivered to the viewer via digital apparatus like a screen? Or how is that different or not from analog screen experiences? Or is the digital image you are interested in an image created by digital means? Most of print today includes images that are actually made by digital technologies. And Rebecca ends, I hope this feedback is helpful for you as you develop your project further. I'm sorry I'm not able to participate in person in some giving a paper at the same time. But if you would like to be in touch later by email, please feel free and so far and so on. And I'll send this to you so you can talk further um, to her. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I, I very much uh, agree with uh, what Rebecca is basically saying. And, and I mean, you said it yourself, right? You have an, a research agenda for, for the rest of your life and that's totally fine. Uh, just with this PhD thing, it means you need to, you know, uh, package it up, take some slice of it, concentrate on that, package it up, be done which is in, in general, I mean, we will talk more about this later, but I mean, that's really the task of a PhD. You know, what is the right scope that I actually can get on, can get past uh, uh, um, um, a committee and then get on with the rest of my life, right? So um, we will talk a little more about that, of course. I mean, for you, I think that also specifically means to look into, since you have not started a PhD program yet, what kind of these topics, if they're similarly interesting to you, will get you into a program, right? Uh, I think survival in academia, at least partially, is, is being somewhat opportunistic. And it's very opportunistic. <laughs> Okay, shut up, Henrik. Uh, we, we, you know, we want to pretend it's all about merit and everything, right? I mean, I, I was going to get to that much later uh, in the day, right? But 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 that is 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 clearly um, a question here. So yeah, I would say discuss further with Rebecca. I think um, yeah, look into what programs you want to target. I mean, with more flexibility you have also in terms of uh, um, you know, geolocation is, is a, a, the better. Um, I can say, I think from, from my own experience, I mean, going to the US was the best thing I could have done, but it's not like I was like, oh yeah, I need to go to the US right away. It took me a while to realize uh, that was the opportunity but I wouldn't be where I am without having gone to, to Georgia Tech and working with Janet Murray and Jay Bolger and Celia Pierce and, and, and people like that, basically. Um, and and uh, uh, don't think that 2005 with uh, a certain Bush on uh, being president was so much nicer in terms of politics. So uh, it was not an easy decision for me to do that. Um, but it's nice to, it, it's, you know, it's, it can be life changing to be in a PhD program where you have support, where, where there's money, where, where you have first rate academics around you. And um, yeah, that's worth quite a bit to put it just like that. Um, a sort of final word, because then um, uh, I should wrap, wrap up at, at this uh, moment is essentially, well, you asked about um, what is could be missing in 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 my in in terms of literature, and what is the question of vocabulary. Um, let me put it like that. I mean, this partially depends on your committee and and your supervisors what they think is is crucial. Um, but you are working in an interdisciplinary field. 
And that's wonderful and interesting, but also super challenging. And to a certain degree, it means you have to call the shots yourself. You have to say, okay, I'm connecting these fields and this is what I'm saying and this is what I'm basing it on. And as long, I think, as you're transparent and saying, okay, these are the scholars that I build my thing on, you are on safe ground. There will always be some resource that you will have overlooked or some reference that somebody else finds important. And of course, that's part of the task for your supervisors to tell you or for if you're your PhD advisors. But no PhD is ever perfect. So, I mean, you just have to be very clear. These are my references. This is what I'm basing it on. And, and then I think you're fine. Equally, in terms of vocabulary, especially once you go interdisciplinary, that is really, really tough. The way out of that I found is that you are very clear about your own terminology. Basically saying, when I use this term, let's say digital artifact, this is what I mean. And it's based on the understanding of Murray, or it's based on the understanding of Bolter, or it's based on the understanding of, um, I mean, somebody I think that could be interesting for you would be Jill Redberg. Um, to look into how, how she does stuff. She's a, a professor at the University of Bergen and has an ERC right now looking at how augmented reality... Or uh, like text me because I, I missed the name. And that was really... Redberg, University of Bergen. Jill Redberg. So she has an ERC, European Research Grant, right now looking onto, uh, I think, basically how... Um, image recognition software uh, adjusts our digital image, basically. So that, that could be a very interesting sort of group for you to look into. And I mean, it's not exactly what we are thinking of. It's, it's even more narrowed down with this focus on image recognition algorithms or the, what they will do to our popular culture. But I think it's, it's a very interesting kind of thing going on. Okay, with that, I, I now see we, we have uh, uh, Professor and Director Phelps here, um, who is somewhere on an island. Hi, Andy. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> but you make a halfway uh, um, 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 thing to that. Okay, uh, well, I want to say thank you, Gabriella. We will talk more about it, of course, later in, in sort of our fireside uh, 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 chat. And I will send you um, uh, Rebecca's uh, uh, comments. And um, well, uh, Andrew, I, I already have introduced you as, as kind of um, sort of the, the impossible uh, uh, to reach um, for us um, uh, uh, Superman, who's director of two programs in two different continents at the same time. Yeah, lucky me. <laughs> Well, at least it does sound very, uh, uh, very impressive. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it keeps you on your toes. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. I think we can only imagine. Okay. Um, but I think with that, we want to go um, to the next um, presentation. So I should stop my um, screen share. And then... Um, uh, do we, we, have, we should have Christina here. Is Christina here? Oh yeah, Christina. Yes. Okay. Um, I should share my screen then. Yes, please do so. Okay. So my name is Christina. I'm from Greece and um, I've just started my PhD with the University of Patras. And uh, we've started working on computational thinking and how we can enhance this through digital games. And um, well, we've started with some systematic review and I'm going to present some foundings I have during the, the last, the past months. So, um, it was difficult to find many papers on computational thinking and early childhood. Um, 
we found many for older students, but not early childhood or elementary education. Um, uh, computational thinking. So it's about problem solving, or algorithmic thinking, critical thinking, and um, all these different ways to break a problem into uh, smaller parts and try to figure out a way to solve it, or maybe the fastest way to solve it. Um, we're we've been looking through game-based learning, so maybe the digital games could um, we could find some digital games used to enhance computational thinking. Uh, it was mostly programming games, but uh, and some puzzle games. Um, many articles, but most of them uh, focus on programming, and we wanted to focus on gameplay. Um, uh, my criteria for articles was um, where articles that had to do about, with computational thinking and digital games and education, uh, articles about coding were ignored, uh, articles about game design were also ignored, and um, I didn't use any journal papers. Um, my main question, can digital games help develop computational thinking skills? Um, while I tried, I started my systematic review, I saw that many people focused on uh, differences, on problem solving, algorithmic thinking, parts of uh, computational thinking. Um, they use different scales to measure the before and the after of um, after uh, gameplay. Uh, but they also focused on those five different things, six different things, problem solving, algorithmic thinking, critical thinking, cooperative learning, and creative thinking. Um, I haven't yet decided which scale I should use. I'm still looking into all the different scales that all these different people have used. So maybe um, I can find something that will work for me. It's difficult because of the early childhood that I'm focusing on. It's way diff different to measure things um, with students aged four to eight. Um, my research methodology. Uh, we've already started with some observations and uh, students playing some uh, games we've chosen. Um, we've asked a lot of questions, short interviews for gathering primary data. Um, Computational skills measured at the beginning of the case study after we find the scale that we're going to use. And we're, we, we will also measure the, different, uh, the difference between the computational skills before, after three, seven, and 13 weeks. And all the gameplay will be recorded. The games that we chose are mainly puzzle games. Um, games that you need to actually uh, think from the beginning which path you should use, you should follow. And they're very classic games, except maybe from the Lightbot, which also has some programming in it. Um, the different levels make it, there are different levels on all these games, and they make it even more difficult while you move on to the next level. So this will also help us to see um, how long it took to the kids to move on from one level to, to the other and uh, how fast they made it to complete one level. Um, I'm not sure about the games. I know that the, the student, my students have tried them and uh, even in kindergarten, it wasn't that difficult as I expected, expected in the beginning. Um, but we haven't actually decided that these three are going to be the games. Lightbolt um, has to do a lot with programming. So maybe uh, it, it's more connected to coding. And this is not something that we would like to use. So maybe we're going to stick with the puzzle games. And um, this is it. They told me to keep it short so, so that I get all this information and advice from you.
Oh, thank you. Good. Um, mm -hmm. We like that. Um, yeah, Andy, can you provide some feedback here? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I, you know, I think it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting frame. Um, I think the the way that you're choosing to target the particular aspect of your study and what you're looking at and what you're not looking at, um, particularly in terms of like, you know, exploring computational thinking, but not using coding as the frame to do that. I think you, you need to be a little bit more explicit about why. Um, in in that because that's that's you know when you're citing stuff out of the out of the um, ISTE stuff, and that goes hand in hand with a bunch of the SIGC stuff in terms of early childhood um, you know computational thinking literature, and much of that literature is centered on you know sort of a learn to code approach, and I think that what you're doing is very interesting, but I think you need to better frame or better, ex more deeply explain uh, exactly what your, why you've made that decision, right? Because you're, you're citing Papert, right? But that whole lineage of the lifelong kindergarten group at MIT and, you know, Scott's work and, and, you know, all of that stuff that happens, you know, down that rabbit hole, right, has geared itself towards, um, you know, sort of a, a early childhood programming centric focus with Scratch and, you know, the, the Alice project at CMU and all of those things are sort of like wrapped up in this ball of, of work. Um, and you're, you're hinting around the edges of it, but I think that you really want to just be very explicit in saying, you know, I've chosen this particular path for these particular reasons. My guess is there is probably, um, probably some good literature about identity formation in terms of thinking of yourself as, as, you know, um, as, as, you know, it, in, in terms of like, um, thinking of yourself as either a computer scientist or as just somebody that's comfortable with technology, et cetera. And, um, there's, there's probably some, some identity work there that would be relevant to the argument that you're making. Um, but I think, uh, you know, again, I think you just, you know, you, you need to, you, you want to engage with that literature, show that you understand it, show that, that you recognize those approaches and that then you're choosing to do something different specifically um, for reasons X, Y, and Z. Um, the other question that I had was the, um, so I think it's good that you're actually going to record all the gameplay. My guess is when you actually start recording it, um, you're not going to know what's significant at first. It's going to take several iterations of review of watching <laughs> what happens um, to sort of to sort of grind that through. It's, it, every time I've ever done game-based studies, um, what you think is going to be important is not what winds up actually being important. And so just record absolutely everything that you can um, about the entire interaction. And you may want to consider, in addition to recording their screens, um, trying to get uh, like facial data and, you know, uh, if they're playing with mice and keyboard, like some of that tracking data as well. Um, <clears throat> and then the only other thing I had um, was, Uh, just in terms of the longitudinal bits, um, you've got th you've got something I hear about like three and uh, three and seventeen weeks and and this stuff. And it, I think that the one of the things that people are yeah yeah three seven and thirteen weeks. And I think one of the things that will be um, super useful if you can do it is to um, continue to try to track and look at where participants in this study, um, how, they, how, 
how is their performance either affected or not affected in any downstream coursework, right? Um, because that's sort of the, the holy grail of early intervention um, work in that space is to try to prove that there is some efficacy for, you know, continued trend, right? And so, you know, maybe it's a, you know, just a quick post survey at, you know, a year out um, to look at what they did um, when they got beyond this particular particular thing, but whether or not this that you could make the um, at least a um, general claim as to long term effect there, um, I think that would be useful. So that's um, I think I think that's what I got for for at least an initial round. I'd be happy to take questions or comments or uh, more discussion, what have you. I would like to ask something very specific about the systematic review. It was very difficult for me to find any papers on uh, the age group I've been looking into. And uh, that also means something, but what happens then? I mean, if you start um, with looking into a specific subject and uh, there is no data about any prior research on that age group. What is your advice on that? Do we just move on to different age groups and then compare our findings to what we've read or? Um, so I think that, I think you would probably then want to triangulate. I mean, I, I there are, some that I'm aware of. Um, the, the Alice Project kept trying to go earlier and earlier uh, in terms of early childhood, and it is a more programming-centric approach, but it is still heavily engaged in computational thinking writ large and, and you know, CS as, a, as, a, as an identity. Um, so that I, if I think, think, think there are some things there, I think that um, you would also um, I would I would cast a slightly wider net. Um, so instead of looking for computational thinking specifically, um, looking at early interventions in you know um, math and science more generally, to look at you know how how early childhood learning in those spaces may or may not be similar. Um, you might be able to find some of the you know if you read like the the active learning theory and the constructionist theory and and all of those, you know, sort of like hands-on project-based learning um, styles, um, you know, that that have been um, have been written about, uh, and there there is some work there in terms of of early childhood learning, and and what that would mean. It may not be as directly applied to computational thinking as you would like it to be, um, but I think you could at least draw the inferences uh, from that work into into what you're doing. I see Hartman nodding in the background. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I was thinking along similar ways, right? I mean, uh, of course, you have already prepared in, uh, in, in, in your reference list, but Piaget, um, um, you know, the work that went into the logo uh, language. I mean, uh, of course, none of that is, is directly what you're working on. And I think that's what Andrew just said, too. Um, but all the work carried out at MIT into sort of getting children uh, uh, to do programming. All right. Uh, I think there's quite a bit there. Of course, you would make, need to make the connection to that. But I think there's a whole body also what went into the, uh, what's it called, scratch, scratch language. All right. Which is, I think you could say, came after um, uh, uh, after logo, then I think for a while, oh God, what was the name? Um, Apple for a while had an, an a scientist Hypercard. in residence. Sorry? Hypercard, I think was the like yes. early, yeah. All right. Things like that, exactly. I mean, in, in terms of, I, I, think, I, I think you're right, but maybe computer, I mean, 
maybe the problem is a bit that computational thinking as a term is maybe a newer sort of idea. Maybe it was just called differently on a certain level or more thought about in terms of, you know, how can we teach programming to children or something like that? Yeah, I think, I think that, um, the idea behind computational thinking as, as I would define it would be that it, it elevates the, it, it's more abstract, right? And so, so it elevates the, the notion to um, thinking algorithmically, whether or not you're actually applying that in code. And I think that, that early stage work uh, was often about trying to get people to apply things in code before they were, you know, they, they hadn't gotten there in terms of the learning theory yet, right? Um, and so when you look back at like the logo stuff and the star logo stuff and the early hypercard stuff and the um, early director stuff and all of those, you know, kinds of, of code without coding um, sorts of sorts of environments, um, they were really focused in terms of the language that they were using to describe what they were doing. They were, they were very focused on, um, on, you know, coding or programming or uh, development writ large. Um, and I think that the shift in language to computational thinking might, to some extent, it might be a matter of semantics, right? Mm. That I, th I think there are, there are some things in, in that literature that would be relevant, um, even though you're not choosing to go for a programming centric strategy, you're still, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still pattern recognition. It's still algorithmic thinking. It's still, you know, all of those, those things. And those things are there, but they may not be highlighted in quite the same way. I mean, maybe there is an opportunity here for you to sort of write a chapter on the history of algorithmic thinking from, you know, a learning early uh, learning, teaching children how to program to computational thinking. Right, and then you have a whole chapter, and you can talk exactly about that, and 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 then you could even sort of yeah try to to nail down what has changed through the semantic change. You know what 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 was the focus before? What is the focus now? Yeah. And uh, that could be quite valuable, and I think also an interesting paper by itself. Right, an interesting journal publication. It's always good to get out of a out of a, a thesis chapter. It always goes back to algorithmic thinking. In the beginning, I was, I was sure it was the same thing, but a different name for it because algorithmic thinking just makes it, you need to actually draw it. While computational thinking is a more vague thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, but, but I mean, I think it might also be like, you know, what is design thinking? And, and when I ask this question, I think we, we can be busy for the rest of the week arguing what that actually is. And, and, and people might, some people might have a definition. Doesn't mean that other people might agree with this definition. And a lot of people just use it as a buzzword without never really defining what that actually mean by design thinking. So, uh, yeah. But so, so I think it would, could be really valuable if, if, yeah, if you write a chapter on that and if you also take a stand, basically saying, you know, this is how I see the difference. And this is how I define computational thinking in this context. Yeah. I would agree. I mean, I, I don't want to, I, I'm, I don't want to steer you towards not framing the study the way that you framed it because I think it's very interesting but I you know again I just think you want to you you want to explain the history of what has been done and then why your frame in this moment right is is charting this this new direction that would be that would that would be my advice <laughs> I mean, it's a very interesting uh, uh, project. I think also challenging one, especially working with, with children, um, is is you know never easy. And 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 getting all these parents' permissions that cannot have been easy. Um, 
So yeah, absolutely. Other questions or comments? Yeah, do you have any more questions for us, Christina? Mm -hmm. I think we've pretty much covered everything. All my questions um, are answered. I'm not very happy with all the answers. <laughs> Way more work than I ever imagined, but okay. Well, very good. Then, then let's go to our next uh, one, who is, who is, I think, further away than everybody, and and I probably should have scheduled him differently. <laughs> um, Matthew, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a one in the morning here, so. <laughs> oh well, you know. Yeah, so I fall asleep halfway through my presentation. Uh, that's why. <laughs> no worries. But I, I think you I just go ahead. Asleep. Thanks for bearing with us. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, we should probably say you're in Australia, right? Mm. Yes, yes, yeah. Although I, I'm from New Zealand, so I was really interested to hear that. Um, uh, what's his name? has been working in Wellington. I thought that was kind of cool. Right. Okay. Cool. Please go ahead. Um, all right, let me just run this one. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep, okay, cool. Um, all right, so <clears throat> I'm just gonna go through basically um, what my thesis is and what I'm looking at. I'm about, I guess, a year and a half in. That's a bit scary <laughs> to say now. Um, I feel like I'm only a year in because the last six months uh, it has, hasn't been very productive for reasons that I feel like are fairly obvious. Um, so my research is on reinforcement learning um, and how you can solve certain kinds of problems within reinforcement learning. So let's just go through the basics. So what is reinforcement learning? Well, reinforcement learning is just a way of trying to solve problems by giving feedback. So instead of trying to tell a computer exactly what to do, or instead of showing it um, hundreds of millions of examples, which is embarrassingly how most AI works at the moment, um, instead of that, what you do is you just get the machine to, um, to give things a go itself, and then you give it feedback on whether it's done well or whether it's done poorly. And an example of this would be chess, where you just get it to play the game, perhaps versus itself, or perhaps versus uh, um, another computer program or even a human, and then you just give it plus one point if it wins and minus one if it loses, and it tries to figure out what does it need to do in order to get the maximum amount of points. Um, now on the left I have, so I've got two games here. Uh, on the left I have chess, and on the right I have a, a game, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this game, Montezuma's Revenge. Uh, perhaps it shows your age if you know this one. Um, so this is an Atari 2600 game, and um, it's, it, you know, it's fairly simple, I guess, for humans to play. But here's the weird thing is if we apply reinforcement learning, one of these games is actually really easy, fairly easy, and one of them is extremely hard. And of course, the one that's really hard is Montezuma's Revenge, um, even though it's fairly simple for a human to play. The reason for that is because of the rewards. So in Montezuma's Revenge, you just get reward zero all the time. Um, until you get to the, the key on the left hand side of that screen. So what will happen is the AI or the agent, it needs to learn how to climb down a ladder, jump onto a rope, not fall off, jump onto the platform, climb down the ladder again, avoid a skull, climb up a ladder and then get the key. And it has to do all of this before it gets any indication about whether it's doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Um, this is what's called a sparse reward problem, and it's a huge issue with reinforcement learning. In fact, it's one of the main reasons that we can't use reinforcement learning for real life things, um, because unfortunately, most problems have this property of being sparse reward. So how do you solve this? Well, it turns out there sort of is a solution to this, um, and that's called intrinsic motivation, which I'm really glad someone mentioned already. So intrinsic motivation is just giving some, uh, someone who has motivation to do something um, because they believe it's good in itself. Uh, so an example would be a student studying or doing their maths homework, not because they want good grades, but just because they love doing maths. All right, so this is an example of intrinsic motivation. 
So intrinsic motivation can be used uh, in reinforcement learning by giving the agent some motivation to explore the world. Uh, in this case, the example I've got here is the agent simply makes a prediction about what will happen when it interacts with the world. And if it's wrong, it gives itself a little reward. So we call this surprise. So whenever it does something and it has an un unexpected consequence, it uh, rewards that and then it says, okay, next time I come to that situation, I want to try that again because I obviously don't understand this part of the game. And if you do this, you can actually get an agent to uh, learn the first part of a Super Mario game. And the really interesting thing is it learns to, to avoid death because um, if it dies, it teleports to the beginning of the level and in the beginning of the level, it's played it a thousand times. So it actually finds it really boring and it would much rather explore parts of the games it's never seen before. So this is a, a pretty cool strategy, but unfortunately it uh, doesn't really work. So the issue is that for every game that it improves, it also, there'll also be a game where it causes problems. Um, and not only that, it has a lot of, like it requires a lot of playing the game in order for this to work. In fact, some recent work on Atari, they managed to get um, 57, all 57 Atari games that we have, um, they managed to get good performance on but it, it took 200 years, <laughs> 200 years of playing the games to do it. So um, that's, mm, yeah, maybe that's not gonna work. So how can we improve intrinsic motivation? Well, here's the thinking, right? Is all of the, almost all the research so far has really focused on a single individual agent, but I, I'm interested in what happens when you put that agent into a population. And um, I've got to be really clear here that I, I don't want the, population of agents to work together. I just want them to learn together. And that's the simplification I'm making because um, working together is what's called multi-agent reinforcement learning and it's extremely hard. Um, so I'm focusing on a slightly different pro problem, which is just learning together. So if all these agents are playing the game and they can watch each other play the game, what can they learn? I've got a little picture here of the, the elephant. This is sort of a classic, uh, I don't know, I feel like it's a classic concept that you, you have a whole bunch of blind scientists trying to understand what's going on and each one has their own experience their own um yeah their own experience and and they're, they're saying what's true for them like what they understand like oh this this seems like i've got a spear or this seems like it's a snake things like that but in a sense they're all wrong um because they all only have a small part of the picture however if these are uh, blind scientists could all talk to each other they might be able to figure out that what they're engaging with is actually an elephant. Um, so the, the, the basic theory is that a lot of stupid people are better than one stupid person. That's the theory. So instead of having a really good agent that knows what to do, just have lots of bad ones and have them um, collaborate in some way that, that gives them better performance. And it turns out this is actually quite this is like a provable thing that you can, if you have many bad estimators, you can uh, put them together to get a better estimator. Uh, it also gives this really cool extra thing, which is you start to know what you don't know. So a key problem in reinforcement learning, or really in most problems, is you get into a situation where you you think you've solved the game, and you you think it's you've hundred percented it, but you're actually just stuck on the first level, and you didn't know there was such a thing as a second level, right? Because you didn't know, you don't know what you don't know, and there's some. Um, potentially could get around that problem. There's also some uh, fascinating ideas in ergodic theory that can be quite helpful here. Um, and that's basically just a way of saying that, that you can sometimes make mistakes that you can't recover from. So if you just have one agent trying to learn a game, it might do something early on that really will ruin its chance or potential at learning the game forever. So a mistake that it can never recover from. And if you have a population, um, then that, uh, that can reduce the chance of that happening or really the chances that that would happen to all agents is extremely unlikely. So what am I doing? Well, I've got uh, three basic research questions that I'm trying to ask. Um, the first one is uh, about what kind of intrinsic motivation works well in a population. So the reason for this is because uh, even though people have looked into intrinsic motivation in reinforcement learning, it's really been done in the context of a single agent and not in the context of a population. Um, I've got three examples there, but I'll just go through one real quick, which is uh, risk, right? So if you, if you tell an agent that it should be motivated to take risks, um, that's almost always a bad idea because it will you know, drive off the 
it'll drive off the bridge just to see what happens and that's not very good for that agent or it'll you know eat the wild berry to see whether it's poisonous and then find out it is however if um if other agents in your population can observe that behavior and learn from it then the group could actually benefit a lot from this um crazy uh, risk-seeking agent. So it could be that there are intrinsic motivations that have been overlooked because they decrease performance for a single agent, but would actually have a, a really positive effect in a group situation. So that's my first question. Uh, my second question is really just about whether you, once you have a population of agents, how do you actually learn from each other? And um, there's, there's basically, I mean, I, I sort of already know the answer to this, I think, which is that you learn from each other's experience. Um, and this is what I'm gonna be looking into on this question. But there's also an alternative strategy that I'll, I'll be investigating too, which is um, this thing called universal value function approximation. Um, and there's quite a lot of technical uh, issues in doing this. Uh, essentially, you need to do something called off policy correction. But um, yeah, that's sort of a, I guess, on the forefront of um, every, every month there's a new pol uh, paper uh, addressing this issue and it seems like someone's already done this work for me so um actually that's a good question what do you do when somebody publishes the answer to your question <laughs> uh, three months after you wrote your thesis proposal review so that would be a good question but um yeah uh, there's some positive research already done in this area that i'd like to continue extending and then my third research question which really i, th I think is my weakest um is just sort of trying to understand whether there are there are real differences that you get when you have a population of agents that you, you don't have when you have a single agent. And the, the three things I'm really interested in here is the ability to adapt to changing environments. Uh, is that something that a population uh, improves the situation with? The second one is learning efficiency. Um, so there's actually been some research that's shown that populations can, in some cases, generate um, it can, can benefit super linearly. So if you have 10 times as many agents, you actually get 12 times the, the learning rate and you're only spending 10 times the, uh, the effort. So um, that would be good to confirm. And then the third one is about robustness. So uh, here's the problem is if you build an AI to play a game, it might just memorize it, it might just memorize some key presses and just learn, you know, you press up, down, left, right, and then jump and, and that's how you win the game. And it hasn't actually learned to play the game, it's just memorized a, a path through the game. And if you did anything weird, like bumped it off its, off its path, it, it would get confused, right? So the thinking is then, does a population of agents give you some robustness to these kinds of problems? So those are my, uh, my research questions that I'm looking into. I haven't done them yet, but I, I've, I've done preliminary experiments just to make sure that that there is pos it is possible to succeed, I guess. Um, yeah, so here's my summary. Research, uh, reinforcement learning is really important. It allows us to solve problems without huge amounts of data, um, but it fails on really simple tasks. Uh, exploration, uh, trying, to, trying to fix this using exploration with a single agent hasn't worked yet. So can populations of diversely motivated agents solve these challenges? I should just clarify there, when I say populations of diversely motivated agents, what I mean is that you, you have a group of agents where each agent has a slightly different goal in the game, where that goal is the, the normal goal of the game, plus some intrinsic motivation that will be um, di different for each particular agent. Cool. Well, I think uh, we're back to Henrik again. Yes. Hello. Uh, so I have one thing that I really appreciated about this presentation was that you actually managed to bake in Condorcet's jury theorem into your- Who's your theorem, sorry? Uh, Condorcet's jury theorem. It's the, uh, the blind scientist thing. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. didn't realize that was the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want awesome. your free reference from yeah. the 1700s, then that's it. Uh, yeah. Because we all need one really Is old really reference from our PhD. <laughs> Is it really from the 1700s? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just people have told theory. me about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, we're not going to get into get into it now, but yeah, you might want to Google that for for fun. Um, yeah, yeah, I will for sure. When I look at this, it's obviously you've put in a lot of work into the sort of theoretical background of this this research, and, and you you understand the problem space. What I am lacking for for, for your contribution is why. 
So why are we doing this? Like, what, what, is, what is the contribution you are making to this field? I, I feel that there's a contribution in here somewhere, but usually if you want your thesis to pass a committee and, you know, get papers accepted, you will need to sell it somehow and make sure that people actually understand why you would want to do this. This is weird and quirky experiment into various agents, right? Uh, so I feel that at some point, do you have, have you thought about the, the why question? Of, yeah, of, so, uh, I mean, um, yeah, so the, the basic uh, argument I try to use is that um, a, AI is a good thing, sort of, right. <laughs> uh, and it potentially could solve a lot of problems. But uh, unfortunately, at the moment, reinforcement learning, which is a, our most prom promising path towards AGI is, mm -hmm. is very limited in that it can't solve some trivial problems due to sparse rewards. So this would be, the contribution would be uh, an algorithm that reliably solves sparse reward problems. Right. So you, you, you mentioned AGI and that, that this is where this becomes, you know, dangerous territory because yeah. <laughs> then you're trying to build something that some people think is impossible and you need to motivate why you would even start pursuing that. So it's, it gets tricky quick. I, I think the reason I'm, I'm going after the why is that there is a, a little bit of a lack of focus in what you're talking about here. Like, like I, you, you, this is, for, for me, it's obvious that yes, this is a problem we kind of would want to solve. But I think on a, on a broader scale, we need to figure out why we are trying to solve it and what this theory will get to in the end. All right. Uh, so you say that it's important to solving big problems without big data, but the question is, what are those big problems? Are we just trying to solve something for games, like how to make games more fun or something, or are we trying to solve, you know, world hunger? Uh, in which case, <laughs> oh yeah, I probably won't so solve world hunger in my in my PhD thesis. Right, no, I, no, I mean, no. so it really yeah, happens. I, I, I'm making a very small contribution, um, but I, I guess the the thing I'm trying to argue for here is that reinforcement learning is a good idea and mm -hmm. does have a lot of value. Um, and, and if that's true, then it needs to work in, it needs to work more broadly. So it needs to work in these, these edge cases where it doesn't work at the moment. So let me ask a, a tricky question and, and feel free to get as technical as you want here. Um, oh, good. <laughs> yep. <laughs> with, in, with this, your question, which intrinsic motivation works best in populations of reinforcement agents? I think mm -hmm. that was your question. Um, when you start adding this, um, when you start look, look, basically trying to create, I guess, family trees of the training here, aren't you sort of creating a recursive problem? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by family trees? Uh, so, so the way I visualize this when you start talking about how they learn from each other is probably that it's going to be end up being a tree structure. Uh, yes. Yeah, oh yeah. So, it, so it's, it's sort of, um, I guess in some ways you could think of it as a star structure. I, I forget what the, um, what those terms are, but I, basically the idea is that all the agents would put, share their, share their experiences. So every agent learns not only from its own experiences, but from the experiences of others. So in some ways it's kind of like every, every AI has videotapes of all the other mm -hmm. AIs that it can use to try to improve its own policies. Right. But yeah, there's not, it's not a, it's not an evolutionary thing. There's, there's no, um, yeah, it doesn't work like that. This is where we, we get into even more technical theory. I don't, I don't think this parallelizes. And if you want to run this in a reasonable time frame, you know, before the world melts, basically, I think yeah. you some reason, like you will yeah. need to parallelize it somehow. And now you're kind yeah, of yeah, creating a yeah. system where you have to, you can only linearly add to this knowledge base unless half of the observations that you didn't need to reintegrate will be built on a different set of, of, of assumptions. So the assumptions will be updated every cycle. So it's going to become very, very tricky, very quick to keep this integrated, which is why yeah, you probably so will do some kind of, tree variant where it keeps branching off and then you have a recursive problem instead <laughs> oh. <laughs> exponential growth yeah so i mean that the, the populations is quite handy because it it does let me i can parallelize every agent within the population so if i if i have 64 agents then i can run them all in parallel um it does make my it does make smoke come out of my computer <laughs> but um yeah yep. uh it, but it, it, it you know computational time is, is a big factor um, and that is something that I do need to think about.
Yeah, so, so what what I'm worried sure. about with with is what happens when you take the data back from those agents. Have you now created 64 lineages of knowledge, or do you have one pool of all the reintegrated knowledge? Yeah, one. Yeah, one pool. Yeah, right. it just goes into a big shared experience mm -hmm. replay. Yeah, and that becomes the next generation of which ones was which one were ones were more successful. Like, how does this knowledge propagate between generations of agents then? Oh, good. I get to go into technical details. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, so in some ways I haven't done this yet and, you know, all of these details are mm -hmm. to be announced, but uh, how I envisage it is it's essentially a circular buffer, which is the standard way of doing experience replay. So you, mm -hmm. you have something like a, a million transitions, something mm -hmm. like that. So it's quite big. And then as the new ones come in, the old ones just disappear off the end. Um, right. And this shared experience replay is, is the experiences of all of the other of all of the agents, uh, and, and then what you do is you you actually um, when you train you you mix the agent's own experience with the general pool of experience. So it's not it's not just training on everyone's experiences. It's sort of mostly training on its own experience, but using a little bit of other people's. Um, and uh, this can actually uh, run some experiments, and it can be quite efficient to do this. Um, okay, you, you sort of every every action you take, you have a whole bunch of agents that all get to learn from that one interaction. So that's, that's where the efficiency comes from. In, in terms of data efficiency, not in terms of compute efficiency, yeah. Mm. All right, that kind of, uh, so I guess that kind of answers my question, um, at least in terms of like, how, how do you solve this computationally? Like how does this not make mm. your computer catch fire or you have to wait until your PhD yeah. is over and then go, oh, 40 years later, I now have a result, cool. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a problem you can tell us computers have to solve, but then you have to have a budget for that. So yeah, at some point. Yeah, we've got a bit of compute here. It's not, it's not unlimited, but we've got a little bit, yeah. Mm. I still think that if we're, we're going back to the, the original point of why, I think you will need to sort of justify why you are taking this. I think mm. you've, in, in field internally, you can probably justify it, but field externally so to a greater the greater population of why is your research happening because maybe if you look at late, later in the career i think we'll, we'll probably be talking about this later on uh during the fireside like when we try to turn this into a position later on if you want either an industry or an academia why did we do this and why was what was the yeah. like what, what, how did the humanity <laughs> benefit from you know, someone paying you to do this basically can, can I say because I'm intrinsically motivated <laughs> or is that, <laughs> is that cheating? <laughs> That's cheating a little bit because uh, whose problem did you solve? I mean, you solved your own problem because you kind of invented yeah. it, but uh, yeah. this problem that you invented, who would be interested in the solution of it, right? And right now I'm not getting yeah. that from the text. Uh, and I think that the, re I, the reason I you have three, yeah. you have three fairly big research questions. I think all of these could essentially become a doctorate. That's the thing. <laughs> Or they could all be things that inform a doctor, depending on how deep you dive into them. Yeah. Because all of them can be really technically complicated stuff, or you can sort of skim the surface a little bit and get away with it. Um, yeah. So making some some decisions about how you want to balance out your, uh, um, I'm thinking as I'm talking here, <laughs> about balance out your questions and why they are relevant, that would really be useful for this later on. Also in terms of publication. Oh. Yeah, definitely trying to figure out the scope is, is something that I've, I've struggled with all the way through it. I, I think when I first suggested what I was gonna do, my supervisor's like, that's, yeah, you can't, a hundred years would not be long enough to do that. Yeah. So um, I, that's something I find really difficult actually, is get, getting the scope down. Uh, if, if it's any comfort, that's a really, really common problem for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Very few people scope their research properly from the get-go. We just, you know, you need to take a hatchet to it at some point. On that note, I looked at your schedule. Um, unless you are a much fat, faster coder than I think most people are, I, I would consider doing two iterations and not three, just to save yourself some time, especially oh, yeah. you know, COVID verse and everything. Yeah, I, I mean, I have got very little done the last, whatever it is, six months, and I'm taking three months off about right. to work on a different project. But um, yeah, we'll see. So I've actually already done a lot of the coding. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't done any of the experiments, but I've, I've already got a, um, most of the coding done. Word um, of warning here. If you haven't yeah. done the experiments, you don't know if you've done all of the coding yet. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. Because it's going so to I've catch the, fire I've, I've in an interesting framework. ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that, that's right. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's and you're, you're you're going to be banging your face against the keyboards, walls, laptops, doors. You know, any flat surface you can find, uh, trying to figure out why it does something when it really shouldn't be doing it, and you'll be stuck for days. <laughs> uh, just speaking from experience, I can relate to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. So I, I would try to. But right now it's, it's very, very a very tight schedule and yeah. all, like all the things are kind of crammed in there yeah. i would really really try to if possible straight i know australia's system is different than the euro system where i am and the, the u.s system so uh, you guys do it in much shorter time yeah it's it's uh, it's way too fast uh, we can <laughs> extend to three and a half years but right, um, yeah. yeah it's not a lot of time See, six I mean, I'm or seven isn't in. uncommon here so <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a difference yeah. in, in how people do these things uh so I, I would strongly consider maybe doing two iterations just for to make this project actually work so would that just mean cutting one of them and then doing just focusing on the other two uh i'm gonna leave it up to you how you cut it i think the i think you are going to find the answers to your last question regardless it's just yeah. a question of how deep you go with that yeah, that's something you're going to have to connect to previous theory and all that. Yeah, that's right. Let me just check the time here. Oh, we're good. I, I time keep myself. You'll right be right. doing excellent for time. So if you have more <laughs> comments, uh, that's, so I mean that's definitely very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I think um, I can't. You, you can almost probably combine your two questions into one and get a more defined end product of what you're actually looking for here. I think that, mm. that could be a thing to think about because uh, that would, you have a lot of extraneous stuff like which intrinsic motivation works best uh, and given a diverse population how do we learn together. Combo so slam those two together. I, I, I'm not going to do it right now, but you could probably find a way to like just take apart the, take it apart, look at the things that really matter to you and put those together. And maybe you try mm -hmm. one or two strategies for uh, intrinsic motivation. I'm just making some notes. <clears throat> and I mean, we all like to, the sad thing is we all like to say that even negative results are results and that could turn into something, but you probably want some kind of positive results in the end, just to placate your community, so, or your community and your committees they don't say what is this then we didn't produce anything yeah that's always a harder position to argue if we're going to think strategically yeah i mean that's why something i think is like the the answer could be no right right yeah. <laughs> the answer could just be no um doesn't help isn't a good idea doesn't work um but so i i mean i did some initial experiments mm -hmm. before i started just to make sure that there was at least a possibility of succeeding, but you know, I don't, I still don't know whether, I mean, the answer really could just be, it's not a good idea, but then I, I can write that up, right? I can say, Hey, this is the reasons why this doesn't work. Yep. And then you can also say, uh, you can rephrase the question to how much faster it became. Well, it didn't. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or, I can quantify the, I can quantify the, what do you call it? The, uh, the lack of results. <laughs> Pretty much. Or you, you can say, failure, like, discuss why, the why this theory, the, you, you can, if, if you have a, 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 that comes out of this not being a working idea, you could bounce it back to the theory and say, this is, this is why this theory doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, so yeah it's exactly. still publishable and still a thesis worthy uh, piece of, piece of research. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But I think, thinking about why and also asking your, your uh, advisor difficult questions about why we're doing this would be really good. Yeah. And you're not yeah. the first person to say that too. So that's really interesting. <laughs> I mean, about the why question, like, yeah. why does this matter? It, Cause in my mind, I live in this world. I'm like, it's obvious why it matters. You know, why do I have to mention this? But then I think, Oh, that's right. You've got to connect dots with people. Right. Like yeah. just, yeah. I, I, you know, reinforcement learning for me is just such a great thing that, why would you have to question any research into reinforcement learning? <laughs> I mean, for all of us, we're like, it, we, when we sit here and do our own research, we're obviously geniuses, right? Where nobody has ever produced brilliance at this level. And then we go out there and you're like, oh, <laughs> I mean, Henrik, speak for yourself here, okay? <laughs> well, I'm definitely an enthusiast, like right? 15 minutes and then you, uh, you see someone else working and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. 
Yeah. 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 But I, I definitely, I do want to work on that a lot more, this idea of connecting to like, what, what is the application? And there are some like applications you can talk about in robotics and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and, and even some real world studies where they've tried reinforcement learning on actual ro robotics that matters and it didn't work. So there's, there's potentially an angle there where I can sort of sell it from that point of view. I think, uh, you don't have to go very far to find, like, considering the conference you're at with Foundation of Digital Games, you, you can probably go like, well, how do we get better at playing Atari games? Or how do we have computers yeah. better at playing Atari games? And that would be a, like a reasonable selling point. Like, no, we just want to figure out how to play games. Yep, yep. Well, the, I mean, Atari is still, <laughs> I mean, we can only beat Atari with 200 years of practice. So, right. so, so that's, uh, I'd that, say that that's could not be your, solved. <laughs> that, that is your, your sort of, uh, your benchmark here. Okay, this took 200 years. Yeah. If I did in 198, I'm officially faster. <laughs> That's yeah. true. That's true. And usually, it's it's not like huge revolutions. It's kind of little tiny steps towards the the goal here, and then we add all of those together, and suddenly we've upped efficiency by 214 percent, and everything's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a big believer in incremental yeah. results. I think that's about the feedback I have, unless you have any questions. I've been talking a lot about this. No, I mean, I was going to ask about sort of just the scoping and in, in mm -hmm. the structure of the research questions, which is what you've covered. So that's perfect, actually. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. Uh, that, was, that was my comments. Oh. Uh, I wish you luck with this. I think it's really interesting. I, I hope to see something come out of it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much for your help. Yeah, no worries. Excellent. Thank you um maybe you can stop yes exactly so we're back sort of to a view where we can see all of us and i was wondering if we need uh, uh, like a five minute break or if we should just continue i mean um i know that andrew will have to leave at one point so i'm a little bit for just continuing but yeah um is that okay with everybody i'm good you're good Okay, um, it seems we also have sort of two guests. I see Ahmed here and, and, and Hans. Um, welcome. Okay, so I mean, in this part, I thought we talk a little bit about what this actually means, right? I mean, yes, uh, we all know with PhDs, we have some sort of a topic sort of thingy and, and you know. Um, and... Well, I, I thought we I'll, I'll sort of start this round with a little bit of a of a provocation, and then I hand over to to Andrew and and Henrik to to sort of to you know continue in this vein. But um, of course, in a sense, you're you're trying to do two things at the same time, right? You're you're trying to successfully complete a, a PhD, and at the same time, you also want to build an academic career. All right, and, and, and these are sort of the same thing, but maybe actually not on a certain level. And that is also part of the, the whole complication with doing that. And, you know, on a certain level, uh, um, um, you might not feel like that, but on a certain level, one could argue uh, the best thing is to be a PhD student. But there is a big problem with that. It ends. And when you're no longer a PhD student, and then what you want to do is you want to find a job, right? And and it's it's a really extensive experience, and and it can also be very challenging. And you probably all heard of also of the uh, clear dangers to to mental health for for PhD students. It's not an easy period in in any way. Um, but yeah, again, I mean, there's this sort of consideration um, to, to get out of this sort of, in a sense, tunnel blick of being a PhD student and trying to finish this thesis thing. And then, oh, there's this other thing, you know, and how do I get to this other side? How do I find a job at, at the end of it? And um, these two, they're, they're not necessarily in conflict, but you know, we sort of need to inform each other a little bit, I feel sometimes. So uh, I think one common issue is sort of this idea of the perfect PhD thesis. 
And the perfect PhD thesis doesn't exist, or rather it does exist. It's the one that's never completed. It's entirely in the head of a PhD candidate. It will never be fully put on, on, on paper ever. It will also never be completed. Every completed PhD thesis is not perfect. It has problems. It, it has mistakes in it. It might even have errors. Oh my God. But it was actually passed by a committee. And, and uh, the person who, who did it actually has this title and can continue with their lives. So I, I think that's, that's we, we sometimes lose track out of that while we're being in this state. That's at least how I uh, uh, you know, have seen it and experienced it at, at parts myself. So to, to a certain degree, it's a bit like, well, let me try to make, I'm, I'm currently in Berlin, so let me try to come up with a, with a Berlin um, um, metaphor. Uh, you might have heard of the Berlin Techno Club Berkheim. And it's notoriously difficult to get into, right? And it's, it's, it's a very long line and there's a bouncer and the bouncer by itself is by now a celebrity and can simply say, no, not you, not you, not you. Okay, you go in, nah, not this time, right? So in a sense, a PhD is a bit like being in this line and it takes a long time. And eventually you will get in. And then it's a completely different ball game. Basically, what is a PhD? It's the entry ticket to a club. And we're so focused on getting the entry ticket, but we are many times a little less, and it's also not really part of a PhD education on a certain level. I think that's a bit of a lack of, of, of PhD education in general to consider, you know, what do we do once we're inside the club? Because then there might be new rules and different things to consider and, and ways to perform and, and all kinds of stuff. Right? It's an important step. You need to complete it. So try not to obsess about the perfect thesis because the perfect thesis will never be completed. To com be, be uh, more of a provocation, nobody cares about your thesis. Absolutely nobody. Forget about it, right? It's just the proof you can do it and we can let you into a club. And yes, there's the rare thesis that actually gets famous and gets published um, as a book happens very rarely. If it happens to you, congratulations, wonderful. Does not really change my point. I mean, as Gabriella said earlier, I mean, it's, it's you can continue your ideas, your research ideas for the rest of your life. This is just the first instance of it. Right? So get this thing done, get it done so your committee approves it. Thank you, goodbye, go on, next thing. What's equally important is to start thinking, okay, how do I get to the next stage? How do I get the postdoc position? How do I get to become an assistant professor? Um, where do I want to go with that? You know, do I want to stay, let's say, in Europe, in Australia, in the US, or do I want, am I prepared to change continents? Is there a favorite country where I want to go? If that one exists, it might be good to start looking at this other country's academic system. So one of the interesting things is people might have similar sounding titles, but in the different countries doesn't mean it's the same thing. There might be an assistant professor in the Netherlands and in the US, but the Netherlands might not really have a tenure track. There's people who are says, assistant professors for life in the Netherlands. Um, well, I mean, in, in, in the US, you're either associate at one point or you're out because there's something called a tenure track, right? I mean, just to get, get an idea how things can be very uh, different. And of course, being strategic about all of this uh, means 
not only looking at the thesis, but thinking, what can I publish? So I have other publications than the thesis itself, but it also means networking, 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 going to conferences, drinking some uh, alcohol, alcoholic lipidations uh, until the V hours with, with you know, some, some people that might remember your name later or not, right? It, it means thinking about uh, having strategic ideas like, um, let's say you have some papers ready that you could publish in the last year of your PhD. To that, I say, don't. Publish them once you're hired in your next job. Because then you're the super person who was able to publish in the first year on the job. Fantastic. Fantastic cut in for, for, for that comment. Uh, if you're in CS, this may be different. Uh, you mm -hmm. will want to publish at conferences, at least during your PhD to be a, even have a chance to get a job after the PhD, uh, because the, the cycle is so much shorter. If you're in humanities, you probably want to, you can wait with publish stuff from your, uh, with your, from your dissertation, et cetera. Well, but Let's if you have a that. number of things available, right? I mean, maybe you can hold back a little bit in the last year. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. So I'm just saying, so, so you really need to start thinking of, okay, how can I pass the thesis that's important? At the same time, I would not advocate to get it done as quickly as possible. That's another obsession. If you can get another year of funding, get that year of funding, use it for extra publication, use it for networking. In the end, nobody cares if you're, I don't know, 31, 32, 33, when you're finished. But what matters is your CV and what matters are your connections. And that's really what you need to focus on. And I know it might feel like, oh, I, I, I need to get this done and everything. Oh, and it's wonderful that this is a short PhD of only three years. Um, if you have a choice, get the longest PhD program you can get. I mean, that allows you to build your CV because that's in the end what matters. The other things uh, don't matter that much, most likely. So, I mean, these are just some, you know, uh, thoughts and I would like now Andrew to, to sort of ramble a bit on in, in the same way, basically, and then Henrik, and, and then sort of get your sort of ideas on all of that. Okay, Andrew. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll preface my comments by saying that um, I have been in academics now for 22 years. Um, I was a department chair, I was a center director, I was, um, I built a couple of academic programs. And so that meant that I essentially hired a whole bunch of faculty um, and also um, moved them through the tenure process. Um, and, you know, in addition to graduating my own students that have, that have gone on to, to other universities and um, and, and other positions, right? So, so both universities and, and in industry and research labs and, and so on. And what I would say is um, the candidates that have always done the best, the candidates that we wound up hiring were able to understand and to articulate a path where what they were doing for their thesis project they turned that into something that was meaningful and relevant to the place that they were interviewing. And so a lot of times what I'll see from, from newly minted doctoral students, right? They, they just got their piece of paper and they're super happy and they're hitting the job market in the, in the you know, probably, uh, probably applying like, you know, around the holidays and then interviewing in, in February, March, et cetera, in the States uh, for a position to start in the following fall. And, and a lot of them would come in and they would just present their thesis. And it would almost always fall flat with the faculty because they're not contextualizing their project in a way that is, you know, 
you know, the, the university created a position. It didn't create a position because they wanted an expert in the one particular thing that you've done your thesis in, right? They created a position because they have research goals and they have teaching needs and they have, you know, uh, you know, opportunity, opportunities for departmental growth and a, you know, strategic vision around that and this and that and the other. And the candidates that were super successful in terms of getting hired and then kickstarting great careers were the ones that were able to take their thesis project, talk about what they did and why it was important to them, right? And then transition that into how that was meaningful in helping the, the university and the department achieve their own goals. Right. And so it meant doing the homework of figuring out a little bit about the place that you were applying for, who's there, what work are they doing, et cetera. And then integrating the thing that you did in that, in that space. Right. And if you can, if you can make that narrative for the places that you interview, you will be way more successful than if you just go and present, you know, here's the thing I did. Right. Because if all you're saying is, here's the thing I did, people are going to say, so what, right? Um, they might think it's cool. They might, you know, think it's, it's, you know, oh, that's interesting work, whatever, right? But their focus is to try to envision you as a colleague for the next 50 years, right? And so that's a different story um, than typically what you're thinking of approaching it as. The other thing that I would underscore is, and I, I feel horrifically bad saying this in the middle of the COVID stupidity, right? But networking, you, you are all at places where your advisor has networks, where the other faculty in your, in your lab have networks. Um, academics is so much about who you know, right? Um, and so just continually expanding your network, continually reaching out, um, I, everything I've ever accomplished in higher ed has been mostly um, through my friends, really, right? It's, it's really about making friends with other researchers and doing interesting things together. And that in, spurred, that in turn spurs other collaborations and other collaborations and other collaborations. And that has been the thing that has allowed me to have the success that I've had. And I, as, a, as when I was the chair, um, I can tell you pretty, pretty reliably after we hired a faculty member within a year, if they were going to make it or not. And it was really a matter of whether or not they were integrating into the department, whether or not they were really like, you know, sounds cliche, but like whether or not they were making friends, whether or not they were becoming a part of the community or they were trying to like really lone wolf it. And, um, and so I think that that is, you know, that would be the one nugget of advice that I would take, whether, whether you're going on to a postdoc position or, a, 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 you know, an, an assistant professorship somewhere, or, um, you know, uh, maybe, maybe even just some stopgap teaching work from here to there, or, you know, a, a term, a term research appointment or something, everything is an opportunity to know more people at that place, which will only help you in the long run. So that, that's where I would take that. Um, I've probably said enough. We'll, we'll get to Henrik and then, and then, uh, and then you know, maybe we can- But, but, but maybe I should reply a real, real quick before <laughs> we go to Henry, because I, I think um, um, just to say that even uh, probably reinforce that even more, but what Andrew just said is, um, to, to summarize that in the word, it's in one word, it's about fit, right? You might be an excellent candidate, you have done wonderful research, but what matters for the department is what the department that hires you considers to be a fit, right? And that also means if you're rejected uh, at, at, uh, at a job, if you don't get it, it is no value judgment of the research you have done. Your research might be wonderful, but it might just not be a fit for this position, at least according to how the committee sees that. And also that means, you know, if you're in a, sitting in a hiring committee, your PhD might be sort of the last thing considered there sometimes. 
people might be sitting around a table with like 200 applications and and they might look and say okay we have these two free courses to teach and that's also kind of what andrew said basically so can this candidate teach these courses for us and that might be the number one check mark on the list so it's also sort of a list of check marks that people go to can teach these courses yeah should work okay um has has um a teaching experience okay check mark right um and of course there's somewhat cynical things like oh comes from a place that we've heard about uh, yeah okay as an advisor we heard about okay next check mark right i mean it's 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 basically things like that and your actual thesis has a phd okay good let's continue right i know that's that's a bit of a cynical thing but you know i've been in in hiring committees i'm not saying that's exactly how it works but well okay on, on to you henry i'm gonna start with this i think that the most uh getting to the point that you think i've ever heard someone talk about a phd thesis or getting a phd is magnus you also uh, one of my colleagues or ex-colleagues and the guy i did my phd with he said it's a yellow belt in science and I think that sort of really gets to the point of what a PhD is. You've shown now that you start out, you get your gi, you get a white belt, you know, you do some tumbles and stuff when you, when you start out as a PhD. And then once you get to your yellow belt, now you can sort of start, and I guess you learn how to grapple or something. This analogy doesn't really hold up in the long run, but, you know, it gives you an idea of, of just how far you get by just getting your PhD. Uh, so it's really easy to stress out about the whole process. I think Hartman was really, Hartman has been kind of been spitting truth bombs this entire time though. So, uh, but he, <laughs> he has, uh, he's got a point and like, it's easy to get caught up in this process of go, oh, it has to be perfect. Perfect is the enemy of good. Good enough is how you finish a PhD. It should possibly be of a quality where it passes. And there, I mean, there are weak and strong ones, but generally it's a check mark unless your PhD is absolute, you know, bottom of the barrel just passed or stunningly brilliant. It's probably not, if you're somewhere in the middle and most of us absolutely are, then it's probably not gonna matter if it's uh, if it's a little bit good or a little bit bad. Like as long as you can check, check that off. And I have to, for all the positions I've gotten post PhD, in every single instance, my social network has sort of been the, the thing that maybe helped me to the, those positions. Of course, I mean, you have to have the merits to, back it up to some extent so you, you actually you're not getting just rejected getting a desk reject basically yeah. but once you have that you can sort of have a better shot at positions if you just know people because they will maybe if you know someone at the department maybe they will advocate internally for them i really know like this henrik dude he's actually like i like him we should hire him or or, or something like that so go i, I mean again <laughs> andrew is saying network and in COVID times, that's really difficult. <laughs> but it, next year, well, once we can actually travel again, go to conferences, like make sure to get funding to go to conferences. I know that's not always easy and meet people, talk to people and go to the social events. Even if you don't feel like it, just go to them and try to have fun. Cause mostly like conferences are mostly drinking with, while watching someone talk or watching someone talk and then go drinking. And it's okay to skip out on a session and, and instead go do a social thing. Cause that's, probably what's going to help you more in the long run than hearing that one paper that you're just going to read anyway. Right. Um, for hiring. You should not have told them that, you know, now <laughs> we, 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 we ruined this whole cohort for the rest of our academic <laughs> career. You know? I think it's better to be honest about that. Also, you know, the social events are usually fun. So why, why not? Uh, but I, I should say that for, for hiring, like I haven't been on a committee, but I've been the victim of, of a couple of committees. Uh, and also, I guess, you know, the victor and, and then some of the committee selection processes. And um, to a large extent, it, it, so I, I've, I've both gotten a job in the US and gotten uh, several in Europe. And the process is very, very different. So you really need to look at the place where you're trying to be hired. So in the US, the process for me was super weird with the fact that I had to go there and, and be interviewed for a whole day on site and everything. Whereas when I got them in Sweden, I had a phone interview and then I just showed up and started working. Uh, so there's, there's a difference in, in like what they wait. So for the US, they took, we had a, a research presentation or more my research goal and ambition. Whereas in, the, in Sweden, I talked more about 
this is, these are my teaching skills because this is sort of what, what the university values differently over there, here versus there, because here we probably have very few fully researched universities, whereas in the US it's easier to get more research time. Um, so you have to look at the market that you're targeting and what they look for in a candidate. And that may be very, very, very different. So do your homework and preferably talk to someone who grew up in that system and try to figure out how that's different. If you can find someone who's from your system and who went to that system and try and figure that out, that's even better because they will know all the weird stuff. And Hartman has something to say here, I think. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. So now having been academic in, uh, in, in several countries, I would say the only people who really know or you can, uh, you can really ask other people who have been in different systems. Because many of the people who have, let's say, never left, for example, the Netherlands, don't really understand what the difference is to the academic system in, in the US, actually. Yeah. And also, this, you touched on that with like translating titles. That's, that's been the bane of my existence for the last couple of years. Like, what is an assistant professor in the Swedish system? Nobody actually knows. And I think trying to figure that out for the, for the UK system is difficult, and they have kind of similar ranks. So also, depending on how your system works, you see an ad, you'll see like assistant professor or something like, oh, that doesn't sound very good. But actually it's, it's sort of a, like a terminal rank for someone in some systems. So this is a long and rambly way of saying, do your homework on where you're applying. I think Andrew also touched on that from the, like the admin side, but as, as someone who's, who's recently a candidate in the process, uh, really do your homework on, on where you're applying. It, it's really important. And there's a ton of like, stuff out there for how you should do this and all the tactics and strategies, but most of them are going to matter less than having a, a good contact network, unless you, as, as, as long as you have all the sort of check boxes checked and you have a decent research vision and you have a decent teaching portfolio and you have a decent, decent uh, research portfolio and all that. I think if someone wants advice for Sweden, I can give that if anyone wants to move up here in the frozen north, but uh, I think that's a little too specific for, <laughs> for this particular thing. Uh, Andrew, just apply for something. You're, you're probably going to get it. <laughs> Pick me. Uh, Andrew, do you really want a third position at the same time or, or no, not no, having no more enough? Job, no more jobs at the same time. No, I'm they're not. not Pokemon. You don't have to catch them all. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I have, I currently have three and it's driving me insane. So <laughs> it's, um, but I would, I would echo that point. I mean, just in, in doing the work that I've been doing the last year and a half in New Zealand, right? The, the Australian New Zealand system is so incredibly different than the U S system, which is again, so incredibly different than the European system. And so, um, figuring out those nuances for where you want to go and what you want to do. And, and they're structurally different across different kinds of institutions as well. So working at a, working at a large public university is very different than working at a small private university. Um, working on a, at a research intensive, um, university is very different than working at a teaching focused university uh, or can be. Um, and so understanding those, those nuances and those differences, um, for the, for the different kinds of positions that you'll see, um, you know, is, is just, it's, it's critical. Um, I can, I can give you, you know, some, I mean, like as a horror story, I had a candidate once apply for a position in my department and literally in his interview asked me like, well, what does the department actually teach? Right. Like, and, and it was like, I guess we're done. Like, you, you know, like <laughs> you can go home now. You know, like you didn't, you didn't even bother to look at our website. Like, come on, man. Like, you know, um, like you, you don't know. have to memorize the course catalog, but at least have a vague idea where they're teaching. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, like, like we had just made the department the year prior and it was focused on games and it was like, <laughs> you know, there's not that much to learn about this. Right? You know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, but you know, mo like I said, I think the people that have that have been successful in those processes that I've seen be successful in those processes are the folks that have um, integrated their history into where they, they they've made a compelling narrative of this is what I did and this is what I where I want to go, right? And that second piece is the more interesting and more critical piece I think for some of these hiring practices. Um, to really, to really forefront, um, you know, how you're going to, how you're going to have impact at the, at the place that's looking at hiring you. 
And I guess the other piece of advice that I would give is that, um, you know, in, in thinking of the, the yellow belt analogy, right, and, and that's, a, that's a good one, um, when, you, when you start a junior faculty position, there are a bunch of other people there that have been faculty members probably for a long time that you can learn from, right? That the, the learning doesn't stop because you got your piece of paper and now you're a professor, right? There are, and I've watched, um, you know, I've mentored several academics over the course of, of my career and I certainly learned a ton from the senior folks that were there when I got hired and when I was a junior, um, you know, figuring out, you know, they're, a part of their mission is to make everyone in the department successful, right? And that means um, mentoring them through the tenure process, mentoring them through uh, promotions, mentoring them through, um, you know, a, a lot of these different kinds of structures. And, uh, and it's different every place and the culture is a little bit different every place and, and so on. But what I would say is, is that there are, I've only seen a couple of times where I've watched a junior faculty member like specifically go out of their way to not work with the senior members of their own department and it has never done them it, it's never worked out for them well right it's just it just doesn't it's not a good idea um so you you know don't think that your your position is over in terms of of using the folks around you as as mentorship networks as as resources um, because in the same way that like right now you have an advisor um, when you're you know you're more independent as a as a faculty member but you you still have that network of people around you um, to use and so don't don't waste that opportunity i'm going to add to that too is that some one of the ways you learn the most is actually teaching other people so even as you, like, if you advance from student to PhD student to TA to professor, I mean, we see, I see this in my role a lot when I teach courses for students. Like I still, every time I teach something, I learn something like, oh yeah, I figure out something new that like, it's a new, a new way of thinking because I encounter a student that thinks kind of weirdly about something. I'm like, oh yeah, so that's how that works. And I, Andrew can fill in on this, but I assume that's how that works. Even when you start mentoring at higher levels, so if you're a full professor mentoring, you know, someone who's got tenure but still is trying to you know get to full etc i mean i think one more thing i i i i think this is all right all, all um important advice and um i think you should all uh keep that in mind um i think i'd like to add sort of one more aspect to that and that's sort of like beware of a catastrophe and um, I mean, it's, it's, it's all good um, if you are, what, what you've heard so far, uh, in, in the case of a stable, sane department. Um, we, we sort of, you know, fact is not all departments are, uh, are either, of, either of these, right? Some are not sane and some are not stable. Um, so basically, I would say be aware that it can happen. You can land at a place that might look good initially, but then turns out not to be. Um, the only way you can sort of fortify yourself against such an experience is never to put all eggs in one basket. Basically, networks, 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 right? Always be aware that you might have to change to a different institution at one point. And it might also be that, you know, you're signing on somewhere, everything goes well, but when the department head gets an offer, goes somewhere else, uh, the, your, your other nice buddy colleague that you've worked on, on very well retires, and all of a sudden things are not so great anymore. Right? You depend on networks and, and you depend on people and these people might switch. They might be gone. Right? So, so if, if you don't be feeling too secure at one place and, and be on the lookout, I mean, as somebody so nicely said, we're always on the market. 
And that's a bit of an unfortunate truth. But I mean, we've, we've seen it even on the highest level, right? I mean, I don't know. I would not have thought that Henry Jenkins would ever leave MIT. I probably would have bet money on it. And whoops, was he gone, right? So, I mean, always bear that in mind too, right? Wherever you go, it might not be the last stop of your career. As a so, general addition to that, for, for general life advice, have a nest egg. Because academic employment can be very, very precarious. And then, you know, a pandemic happens and the starts get delayed or you have to find bridging employment or you're just simply out of a job for a while. I know it's really hard as a PhD student to save up money, but as soon as you get in your career, don't buy a Lamborghini and a what 95 inch TV, but actually try to save some money. That's general life advice here, but I see a lot of students go and get out and then immediately upgrade to fully mortgaged. And that's not generally a good idea. Art was nodding here. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think for a colleague of mine at UGA, it worked very well, but he really bought a house in the first year. And well, this can, you know, go dramatically wrong. Well, if, if you're buying property in, a, in an exploding real estate market, then you're probably going to do well, but sure. just don't buy at the peak. Yes, absolutely. But I think so, that we're getting into economics more than academics now. You're get, getting more, absolutely. But again, so, you know, do all of that, do networking all the time. Um, um, uh, um, um, what I say to PhD students normally is, um, a conference goes from nine to two, and I don't mean two in the afternoon. I mean two in the morning. And if you go home earlier, that's your fault. And yes, a conference is grueling. You know, no, no excuses here. That's just the business. Um, and of course, you know, try not to just hang out with your fellow PhD students. You know, hang out with, you know, the, the, some more seasoned people uh, in, in the field, you know, because these are the people who give you a job. I mean, that's part of uh, the thing you want to do. Yes, Henrik. Yeah, e even scary people like Andrew here, like you can probably approach them at conference and talk to them. They're, they're still humans, so. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, I mean, Andrew always goes home and never drinks, so that's difficult, but. Right, right yeah. Catch him during a session. Good luck, good luck selling that one. <laughs> um, I, I see that, that Josh is also part of our uh, little meeting here. Josh, do you also want to say something about all of that? Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for uh, uh, letting me speak. Uh, I was just hopping in to, to hear what you all were saying in the fireside. Uh, you've all been saying things that have been dead on to my experiences, frankly. Um, you know, having hopped from uh, American University, hey Andy, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, hopping to an R1 university now at UC Davis, uh, you know, it's been, you know, seeing very, very various vantage points in the American system, uh, you know, seeing how the uh, perspectives on research versus teaching change versus like uh, really the need to find funding and to grow a lab. Um, you know, all these are things that you should be like, you know, thinking about at some point when you're starting uh, to uh, look at the job market, you know, maybe when you're like two years before graduating or something like that, to see what sort of like persona you want to build as an academic, uh, I think is quite important as well. And that'll really help you target the institutions you want to go to. Uh, that's the, I guess the one little tidbit I would, I would like to add. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and especially during the last year of your PhD, you know, you think you you might think your job is to finish your PhD, but that's only part of your job. Your your job is also finding the next thing after the PhD, the postdoc position, the assistant professor position, uh, things like that. Because you know, again, you don't want to have a nice piece of paper and uh, be more or less on the street. So Just that's start what you want to your last year. Hmm? Start applying your last year. Like Absolutely. before you graduate, you need to start applying to have a chance of getting, scoring a job. So you don't have like even a gap in unemployment, ideally, but you know, it happens. Also, I mean, at least in some European countries, especially in the, in, in the Scandinavian countries, be aware if you apply there that, that um, it might take a year. Yeah, so I one position I got the position I got at Uppsala University. I applied in 
May and I was hired March 1st the following year. And that was a fast hiring process. So in some systems, especially Scandinavia, there's a lot of bureaucracy to get hired. They have to like have expert panels and there's meetings and there's committees and it's, it's even more Byzantine than the US system. And so it takes a long time to be prepared for that. So like you need to apply early. I once applied for a job in an in an uh, Scandinavian country uh, at a at a university, and it took so long that I thought it was long over. And then all of a sudden, about I don't know, ten months in, eleven months in, I get an email from them saying, "Oh yeah, and and uh, you're one of the you're you're uh, one of the last two uh, candidates, and and do we have permission to send your uh, CV now to the evaluators?" Right, and and in the end, I didn't get it. But I mean, yeah, I, I thought this was long over, and and yeah. it wasn't. And an evaluator can take the evaluation process for that can take up to six months too. So there's like a, a, a long delay in case anyone wants to go north. I'm just saying. And I think that uh, it's basically, yeah, it's true for all Scandinavian countries essentially. And um, while in some other countries, hiring decisions, of course, can be much, much quicker. Um, yeah. And I think we said that already be aware of these differences and, and do your research essentially on that one. Um, okay, we've been talking a lot now. Um, what are your questions? Are you all thoroughly confused? <laughs> I don't think so. Do you want uh, to give up now? I mean, now that, that you know the, the, the sad truth. I think yeah, we all I, already knew it before. And okay, well, that's good. You just articulated that very well. <laughs> Um, I'm just curious because now I feel like my focus of the PhD is slightly more restrictive in the sense that it's an industrial PhD and at least in Denmark that's like a specific thing also um, but in any case I work together with a you know company and that kind of restricts what I can freely research so I'm just wondering if you have any experiences with uh, like collaborations and uh, of, with different companies and industry and how that has uh, like either colleagues or yeah, just your experiences in general with uh, co such collaborations. I think Andrew can, Andrew can probably answer that best. Yeah, I, I, I've been a part of several different projects where we've worked um, we did a couple with industry where we worked directly with with Microsoft Research, and we did um, we did a, a couple of others with some um, government agencies that that had um, pretty restrictive um, security policies and stuff about what we what we were allowed to say and what we weren't allowed to say, and and those kinds of things. Um, and it's uh, you know I mean it's mostly been okay. Um, we you do have to be really upfront and careful about the fact that you you need the rights to publish the on the work that you're doing because that's the the sort of coin of the realm of showing that you were active in these spaces and that that um, you know that that's how academics show productivity and so you want to make sure that you have the the broad ability to publish uh, on what you're doing. I know that um, in one of the situations I was involved in. Um, there was actually a review process for things that were being published um, where they had to go to um, like Microsoft and they would have to either, you know, say, yes, this, uh, this, we're fine with this going out the door or in rare cases, uh, you know, adjust some of the language to preserve, um, you know, something that could be considered uh, proprietary. Um, and, you know, they were, they were a pretty collaborative group. So it was, it was okay. Um, um, so, but you do it, you, you have to, you have to manage those partnerships very carefully um, because other, otherwise, um, you know, industry loves the idea of using academics for free labor uh, and, um, and you want to make sure that you're not actually, you know, being, being roped into that. Um, but, you know, that, that is increasingly common right now because, um, 
industry has money to fund research. And oftentimes, at least in the States, the government um, has no money right now because we're, uh, you know, content to waste it on other things, um, you know, uh, which is very different than my New Zealand experience. So it, it was a little cognitive dissonance there. Um, but that is a, um, in, in several of the labs that I've been appointed to, we, we, we've done different styles of um, public-private partnership around uh, research and development with, with different companies. Um, but again, I don't think that that would preclude you from talking about the things that you're doing and creating a narrative around how those things have value to the next place that you want to land, right? Um, that's still the, that's still the critical piece, and and I think that most people would be understanding of saying, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I was in this very particular role with this particular project, and it was structured as such. Um, but then they're going to say, okay, but now you're not. So what's next, right? And you want to have solid answers to to that. I'm going to add on a little bit to that, if I may, because we, Sweden also has a similar type of position with industry uh, PhDs. Uh, I think a, an analog-ish position could be a research scientist in the U.S. system. So it's kind of similar to that, except this is more university tied. You're kind of a student, but you're not. It, it's a weird position to be in. Uh, I think, are yours also eight years long instead of four? Or how long? Uh the well the industrial phd itself is just three years right uh, and then you know i guess five years of uh, you know bachelor and masters right okay yeah no so, so the way that works up in up in sweden is that we have you do the phd half time and then you work for the company half time it takes about twice as long usually uh so it's a little bit different i guess but okay yeah this one is uh, basically just three years but still, still half half at the right. company and at the university. So it's probably more tightly integrated, I guess. Uh, I think you could, if, if you're interested, uh, I don't know a lot of, I think Andrew and Hartman and maybe Josh are gonna shy away from this, but there, there is probably a career as a research scientist if you really, if you really wanna do that. Uh, being a professor doesn't have to be the end all be all of, of being in academia in the US if you wanna go there. If you wanna stay in, in, in Scandinavia, or stay in Denmark and Sweden and Norway and all that, you can probably find you know, regular professor positions there because this would be e of equal value basically in fact your industry experience would probably be a bonus for, for some positions especially if you're in cs which i know you are <laughs> yeah i mean if you're in tech there, there are research scientist positions available at all the major places in the u.s yeah. and they're, hmm. they often they often pay much better than academics <laughs> honestly so <laughs> again know. especially in cs the, the pay is actually really good for some hmm. of the research positions I mean, it might also be important for some, in some European, about half of the European countries has basically a binary system, meaning um, sort of polytechnics and universities, right? And uh, in, in countries where you still have polytechnics, that could also be a target because we especially value people with in the industry background. At the same time, these institutions normally do a whole lot less research and the research where we're doing, we call applied research. And yeah, it's, it, it's more guided sort of by, by say, let's say questions from the industry. For, uh, for example, I mean, the Netherlands has such a system, Germany has a, such a system, but for example, the UK um, abandoned it in the early 1990s. So that, that's, you know, it can be helpful in some countries to, to a certain degree. And actually the Netherlands right now is considering creating sort of a complete sort of <clears throat> second sort of uh, a, a third cycle, which we will call a professional doctor. Sort of as an alternative to a PhD uh, uh, to be entirely focused on applied. How well this will work is anybody's guess. Uh, one could argue Finland has tried and, and failed. And why the Netherlands wants to repeat that experiment is anybody's guess. So, yeah. Oh, well, what could possibly go wrong? No, nothing, right? Just to play with, with a lot of people's lives and careers, basically. Um, yeah, any more questions? Thanks for the answers. They were 
very insightful. Also, the people that we can't really see here, Hans and Ahmed and Erika, I mean, we're happy to take questions from you. Okay. Well, I mean, um, I guess if, if there are no more questions, we can also wrap this up here um, slightly early. Um, well, with that, I really want to thank all of you for being here, um, especially the mentors, Andrew and, and Henrik. Um, and I um, also want to thank so the Rebecca in, in absence and in, in Scott also for, you know, initially his willingness to be here. Um, again, absent because of COVID. And yeah, I mean, I think we said that already. I mean, all of us are available via email and on, on Discord if you have further, you know, questions, absolutely. So uh, please let us uh, know. And, you know, of course, I mean, it's all about networking as I think we all try to make very, very clear here. So with that, uh, yeah, stay in touch. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Cool. See you. And enjoy FTG. Absolutely. <laughs>